Initiating podcast download. Prepare yourself. Put on your spandex. Lace up your boots. Wrap your wrists. Hide your razor blade. Head to gorilla position. Grease up your hair. Apply baby oil. Okay, apply more baby oil. Get into gimmick. Keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Have fun and be safe out there, brother. Welcome to I'm on Wrestling. Now your host, Gregory Iron. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Iron on Wrestling with Gregory Iron. I'm your host, Gregory Iron. This is episode 129. I'm feeling fine. I'm happy to be here today, and I'm happy to bring you another exciting episode with our special guest, Tony Deppin. He's one of the more well-traveled independent professional wrestlers, and we are going to hear Tony's story here today. Of course, we will also talk about his recent conflict with comedian Ron Funches, as well as his TV championship win in Ring of Honor, and how he got started in wrestling, just I'm sure a plethora of other things, maybe his likes and dislikes outside of wrestling. I don't know where it'll go, but we'll find out soon as we talk about... Pardon the interruption. Aaron Bauer in the house. Welcome back. Thanks. Better for you to be in the house than in the hospital. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm sorry, that's local medical facility. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know we had a list of banned words (laughs) here on the show. Words and phrases we cannot say. But uh, it is nice to have you back. Thanks, it's nice to be back. Okay, so you want to give us a rundown of what happened exactly? Um, okay. Well, last Monday, I, uh, had one of those panic attacks or anxiety attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in no condition to do the show. I called you or text you. Actually, I don't even remember talking to you. You didn't talk to me. You just sent me a text and said, can't do the show today. And I said, why? And then you did not reply. And I didn't speak to you for 24 hours. Roughly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. Uh, don't even remember, barely. So That's terrifying. Yep, yep. <clears throat> Out of my head, dude. And uh, so, uh, let me see then. Wednesday, I went to work. I was at work for an hour. I got very sick. I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, I... Um, Let's see. I had thrown up roughly 10 to 20 times before work. I made it to work. I thought I was getting through work. I was there for an hour and I left. I said, I'm sick. I I think I'm dehydrated. I don't know what's going on for sure. I I just, I can't be here. I went home. Got under the covers, stayed in bed, got up and watched Rocky later in the evening. The original? Yes. Okay. And went back to bed. Um, The next morning I got up, Veterans Day, I had plans to go do stuff. I was going to go Christmas shopping. Um, Didn't trust myself to be able to, to make it through. A day of Christmas shopping. Sure. Well, DTA, don't trust anybody, including yourself. Yeah. Don't trust Aaron, DTA. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. So 
<clears throat> I um, I had already gotten ready, and and I canceled my plans. I tried to go back to sleep. I was in a lot of pain because I had been throwing up so much over the past couple of days because of this panic attack and anxiety. I was sweating profusely. Um, all my muscles were cramping. So I was having like muscle spasms, Charlie horses. And I'm talking legs, arms, stomach, back. Yikes. And at that point I said, okay, something's wrong. Maybe I have COVID again. <clears throat> Decided I had to go get tested. I was going to go to one of those little rapid job places. And uh, I decided against that and drove myself straight to the emergency room. It was that bad? Well, because I knew I needed to get rehydrated. I drank five Gatorades that morning trying to feel better and rehydrate myself, electrolytes and all that. Drank water. Nothing was working. I went straight into the ER. They said, what's wrong? I said, I think I'm having uh, anxiety attacks and it's causing me to throw up and I'm dehydrated. And they said, okay, take a seat in this waiting room over here. Well, at the hospital that I went to, they have a waiting room, which is designated just for people suspected of having COVID. And then they have, if you don't have COVID, if you have like a broken leg or something, then you just sit out in the hallway. So, only you know the one room is filled with COVID, COVID, maybe possible COVID people. Mm -hmm. And I was in that room for three hours and ten minutes. Well, you made a classic mistake, which I'm sure Nicole will appreciate me saying this, having worked in the emergency room. You should have said that I think uh, I've been having panic attacks and I'm dehydrated, and also chest pains <laughs> because when you uh, say chest pains you immediately yeah. get to go to the back and i've told nicole that and she said that is horrible and you should not do that yeah <laughs> and that is very annoying right uh but yeah you should have said chest pains because then you could have cut your wait time by about three hours right right well i wasn't thinking that and i wanted to call you to see if you would take me but i knew you were gone was this wednesday a wednesday uh, this was now Thursday. I was gone. Yeah. I was on my way to Horror Slam uh -huh. in Michigan. Right. So <clears throat> I um, I waited in that waiting room, and I kept thinking, okay, I'm just going to leave. But I've already waited all this time. Right. And there was a marathon of Friends on. And I liked the show Friends, but I was so fucking sick of Friends. <laughs> you know, by like hour two. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> but I kept watching and there was a woman that was there before me and she had been waiting and she was in a wheelchair with COVID suspected COVID I guess and she kept waiting kept waiting and then she went up after like two hours and she goes I've been waiting over two hours and um, they said you know it shouldn't be long and they said, uh, yes, uh, the secretaries, you know, uh, reception, whatever they do. Um, yeah, uh, we have no control over that. And she said, okay, well, I'm just going to leave. And they said, well, you're in a wheelchair. <laughs> and she stood up and walked. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. It was a miracle. <laughs> she was so sick of waiting that she found the the will <laughs> to get out of her wheelchair. I think she was, I think the whole wheelchair thing was she was so weak that she, you know, couldn't really walk. And then she found the strength when she was just pissed off enough. Wow. So she leaves and I go, man, I feel bad for that girl. But that means I'm that much closer to getting in. Oh, yeah. And so 20, 30 minutes go by. This woman comes back. <laughs> she says, did they call my name yet? He said, Wait, no. what? No, that doesn't count. No, you, you left. Yeah, you And she goes, oh, well, I'm back. Um, am I back on the list? Can I get back on the list? And the lady at the reception desk goes, 
Oh, look. I never crossed you off. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, come on. Like, oh my gosh. So then That's my dreams bullshit. are you, you can't just leave and then come back and be like, what's up? <laughs> we good now? Because I was afraid to even go to the restroom that they'd call my name and then I wouldn't be there and they'd just move the next person. I'd have to go to the back of the line. Whatever. Yeah. But I did go to the restroom. I had to go pee. I went pee. And all of a sudden, a fire alarm goes off. Oh, boy. And I'm like, what's this noise? And I look up and I see that, you know, little fire symbol that you know, is above, like, uh, is it the ceiling? I saw that going off. It was flashing. Oh, my gosh. There's a fire in here. This is going to be even worse. And there's like 500 people in here. So I come out of the bathroom. I look around. Somebody's telling everyone it's uh, it's a mistake. You know, there's a short in the fire alarm system. Do not leave the building. I go back. At this point now, I'm in full panic attack again. Full anxiety. I'm sweating again. I mean, soaking wet sweating. I'm pacing back and forth, waiting to go. I uh, My muscles are, you know, spasming. I'm having all kinds of bad thoughts. Finally, they call me back. I get back in. They had taken a blood test. They took a, a COVID test. They asked me what was going on. I told them. And, a, and a, the doctor that saw me, she looks and she says, um, Hey, uh, you said your stomach has pain in it? And I said, yes. I said, uh, because of the dehydration, you know, my stomach has uh, keeps getting these Charlie horses. And uh, she goes, so you're saying your stomach hurts? And I said, yes. And she goes, gallbladder. Yep. Probably going to remove your gallbladder. And she I said, I, I think I just need like fluids. And she says, no, I think it's the gallbladder. Show me where it hurts. Exactly. And I show her like, it's always like, the top of my stomach, bottom of my chest, you know, is where, where the panic sets in. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's on fire or something and it's spinning and you can't do anything about it. So she says, yeah, okay, we're setting you up. You're going to get a, I think it was a CAT scan for that. And then she says, she says, yeah, uh, we're setting you up for the CAT scan and we have you, it looks like, looks like your heart rate is through the roof. It's out of rhythm. Okay. EKG. So she orders an EKG. They do an EKG on me. You ever had one of those? So I don't, I Where don't, they put the little sticky things on you and the wires and. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. So had that. My heart rate was elevated. Um. There was a, a second doctor came in, and a student doctor was in there. The second doctor comes in, and he looks, and he goes, Oh, I see what this is. Sir, are you on cocaine? <laughs> what? And I said, Huh? And he said, Are you addicted to cocaine? And I said, No, dude, I'm fat. Like... <laughs> Look, hey, I'd hey, be skinny. Hey, 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 my mom died of of a cocaine overdose. Yes, and she was very large. Oh yeah, so, yeah. So I never pictured your mom as large. Really? Yeah, I've always thought she was a little skinny bitch. No, no, no. Huh. Very, very chubby. Uh, I she, pictured her like you, but with like longer hair and like more cracky looking. That's sort of insulting. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't feel know that, that it is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, she was. She was. She was very large. Yeah. yeah okay. Very, uh, defied the logic of crackheads, really. Wow. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was like, yo, uh, no, I, I don't do cocaine, and uh, so. The, they put me in as um, uh, cocaine withdrawal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you told them, like, nope, nope, yeah. don't do it. And they're like, okay, uh, let me make a note here. Cocaine withdrawal. They said, well, you have all the symptoms. You're shaking. You're sweating. Uh, you're definitely withdrawing. And I was like, okay. And, they, and they said, <laughs> You just went with it? 
I didn't know what else to do. All I wanted to do was to get rehydrated. Yeah, but I would have been <coughs> kind of annoyed and angry as a man who does not do drugs. Well, I just like, said, yeah. I said, I don't, and I said it a couple times, and yeah. then I, what do you do? And plus, I was in full, you know, anxiety attack mode. Yeah. So, they, um, uh, they, they sent me to this other room, and a counselor comes in. <laughs> the, this drug counselor comes in. And he asked me if I'm open to treatment. Oh, come on. And I said, uh, sure. I said, I'll, I'll get treatment. Said, Do I get hydrated now? And they said, they said yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to hook up the bags to you. And and then they said, we got to get you calm first. So they gave me um, an Ativan. Okay, if you know, do you know what an Ativan is? Mm-mm. It calms you immediately. It's a, it's like a Xanax. Okay. And do you remember what I used to be hooked on? Yes. Okay. So they give me one. It does nothing. They give me two. They do nothing. Mm. They give me a third one. You start hulking up. <laughs> yeah. And then, then they inject morphine into me. Oh, my God. What is happening? Now we're at four out of N. We top at five. Once we hit the fifth one, I'm cool. I'm finally cool. I'm not shaking as much. I'm not sweating anymore. And I'm feeling fine. And the Charlie horses still haven't gone away yet, though. So they have me in this other room. And they told me I got to wait for the doctor. So I wait. And I wait. And I wait. And it's the next day. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting all day. And I start asking, hey, I haven't seen a doctor yet. Yeah, they didn't give you any updates? No updates. Just fluids. And my normal meds, you know, that I'm supposed to take every day, like a Prilosec and you know, stuff like that. Um... And then, like, diabetes meds and stuff. And then they go, yeah, we don't do your normal diabetes meds, so um, we're just going to give you shots of insulin in your stomach. Uh, that's not the same thing at all. Well, I take pill form. Yeah. But they don't do pill form because they said the pill form messes up, like, if you need to do an x-ray or something. Yeah. So... They were doing shots into my stomach. Ugh. Yeah, that's that's not my favorite. <clears throat> so you don't get one of those little rolly things that you see, like Mick Foley and Terry Funk were coming down the aisle with, and when they busted out of the hospital, mm-hmm. you know, with a, yep. okay. So the little rolly thing that comes, um, you don't get that. You're just hooked to the bed to the thing it's it's stationary sure so every time you need to go to the bathroom and you're getting rehydrated so you have to go to the bathroom quite a bit you have to call for a nurse and you don't have your own bathroom when you're in the er you have to use you know there's two bathrooms so i um i have to get disconnected from my iv and then i get to walk to the bathroom so I go to the bathroom, and I, I go to the one that says vacant, and it's got the little green color, and I open the door, and there's a woman standing there, and she's pissing in a urine cup, oh, okay. and she looks straight at me, and I go, oh, sorry, the door was unlocked, and then I shut the door, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm embarrassed, yeah, it's awkward, sure. I walk back to my room. I wait five minutes. I walk back to that bathroom. It says vacant. <laughs> I open the door. No. She's right by the door. But she's on. got her gown up and she's wiping her vagina. No. Why? It was so bad. Does she not know how to lock a door? And I had already walked in on her. Why didn't you go lock it then? Oh. Oh my like god. Like maybe the first time you forgot or you had to go so bad that you just or whatever. <clears throat> Two times. 
after that, I went back and I told my nurses what happened. They go, oh, that happens all the time. Okay. Here in the emergency room. Mm. And I said, all right, um, can you just give me one of them bottles to piss in? I'll just keep it by my bed and I'll just pee in it all night. And they were like, yeah, sure. I had finally asked the nurses. I said, look, I have not seen a doctor since I've been here. Except my initial come in when they said they thought I was on cocaine. And uh, they said, yeah. I said, so can I see this doctor? I need to see the doctor. I need to know when I'm going home. I've been here, you know, a long time now, over 24 hours. And I said, the nurse straight up looked at me and said, that's the big mystery of the day here. I said, what's that? She said, you don't have a doctor. And we don't have a doctor for you. And we don't know who your doctor is. And I said, uh, I don't know. Just give me that guy over there. And I pointed to some guy in a lab coat. <laughs> and I was like, is he a doctor? Oh. And she's like, no, no. He's uh, whatever, phlebotomist or something. This and is I like you getting a cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like you don't understand like how this works. It just you can't just point at someone that looks like. Well, a no, because at this point, I just wanted anybody. I go just, I say, Doctor Dre. I'll take anybody right now. Okay, uh, <laughs> Doctor Tom Pritchard. Give me Doctor Tom. Aaron at the cell phone store. What he he uh, dropped his cell phone in the toilet a few weeks back. He just was pointing at phones and saying, oh, I like that phone, give me that one. And they're like, well, what's your phone provider? He's like, I, I don't know, I just, I want a phone. And he was getting very old man annoyed. Yeah. I, I think we talked about this, but right, we did. just as a refresher. Yeah, so I so just, I don't care. I, I want to see, because I want to leave. I, I'm hydrated now. I think I'm good to go. <clears throat> so they said they were going to try to locate a doctor for me. They call in, uh, um, oh, this guy to take my vitals. He comes in, and I said, hey, is there any way you can help me here? Um, apparently, I don't have a doctor, and they can't find one for me. And he goes, what? That's so silly. <laughs> he looks at me, and he goes, you're in a hospital. That's, that's why people go to hospitals is because there's doctors in them. Yep. There has to be a doctor. And I said, they told me they can't find a doctor, and there's no doctor for me. And he said, well, and he looks at the bags of, like, saline and the banana bag that they gave me, you know, mm -hmm. to pump me full of fluids. Yep. And he said, somebody had to order these. He goes, well, this lady's name right here. I said, I don't know. He said, don't worry. I'll take care of it. And he said, wait a minute. Let me check. You're serious? You haven't seen a doctor? I said, I've been here almost two straight days, and he looks me up, and he goes, Sir, you've been here 35 hours, and I see here it says you haven't seen one doctor. <laughs> That's awful. Yep. And he said, and you're still in the ER. Why haven't they taken you to, like, a real room? I said, I don't know. That's why I'm reaching out to you right now. He said, I'll do my best. He leaves. 40 hours go by <clears throat> it's now one o'clock in the morning i am uh at this do point doing uh toe touches okay i'm standing up you know I, i'm trying to stretch because i'm starting to cramp again yeah and because i've been in a bed for 40 hours basically except for the times i tried to get up and go to the bathroom and that was a terrible mistake so some guy comes in, bursts through my room with a wheelchair. He's like, all right, I'm here to take you to your room. I'm like, uh, it's one in the morning. I'm trying to leave in a couple hours. Right. And he's like, well, I just I have orders to take you to a room. I said, okay, do they have doctors at this room? And he said, oh, yeah, you're going up to the fourth floor. They've got a doctor right there on call and good nurses. I was like, wait competency <laughs> about time so i jump in the wheelchair he gets all my belongings we go upstairs they put me in the king size suite it's beautiful in this room mm -hmm. it's got um cable tv and all kinds of things 
And I get all comfortable. There's a nurse in there. She's like, I can't even tell you what's going on with you right now, though. She said, but if you have questions, I can answer them other than that one. She said, and actually, just don't even worry about why you didn't have a doctor. We have a doctor here that will see you first thing in the morning if you'd like. And I said, yes, please. So basically it came down to I was uh, diagnosed with my sodium was too low. Mm -hmm. My liver enzymes were too high. I was dehydrated and I was having uh, anxiety attacks. And at some point I enrolled for... um, uh, crack cocaine treatment, yeah. uh, Glen Bay and Rocky River. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> what the hell? And then uh, the next day, I was discharged. That's good. Yeah, I, I really hope you break your addiction, though. <laughs> I, I think I speak for everyone listening to the podcast as well. You know, it's um. Coke addiction is a very serious thing. Yeah. Well, they ended up erasing that because my drug test came back and I had no <laughs> numbers in anything. Oh, okay. Well, then, <laughs> that's great. Because, like, I started looking. You know, you can you get to the, a little app on your phone if you go to the Cleveland Clinic. Mm-hmm. And that app gives you your test results. And so I looked up the results. Like, it came up on my phone. And it said, uh, you know, blood uh, blood drug tests what results and everything was zero 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 mm. and uh, so the the nurse the competent one that I had you know the, like the last one I saw she was looking at the numbers and because I, I said hey is there any chance I can get something to help me sleep because it's like 1 30 in the morning now and I just want to get some sleep before uh, I go, you know, in the in the morning because I'm sure I'm being discharged. Yeah. She said, "Honey, I don't even know why you're here." <laughs> she said, "We don't have anything to keep you here. There's there's nothing." And she's looking and she goes, "Wait, they wouldn't give you anything to sleep downstairs?" And I said, "No." And I said, "Because uh, I think they thought I was addicted to crack <laughs> cocaine." And she said. <laughs> No, I'm looking at your record here. You have no numbers. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get at something. And so she calls it. She goes, yeah, you got two melatonin on the way. I'm like, thank you. So I take these melatonin. Took me a minute to fall asleep. Fell asleep at 3 o'clock. 4 o'clock, the orderly comes in. He's coming in to check on me. Dude, I was asleep for one hour. And he starts shaking me. And I got up and I started swinging. And I did not mean to intentionally. Oh, and I went, get back, motherfucker. Okay. And I started swinging left and then right. Left and then right. And he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, man. Hey, man. What, I was just checking on you. Why is that a normal reaction for you, for someone waking you up? I was only asleep for an hour and I hadn't been asleep for, you know, 30 hours before that or something. Yeah, but was, I don't know if I Plus, would, I was already crazy. I feel like... Even if I hadn't sl- slept for a while, my reaction wouldn't be... I don't want nobody touching me. All right. If I'm sleeping, don't touch me. I got shit from when I was a child. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, anyway, oh, and so uh, they gave me Zoloft for uh, a prescription of Zoloft to start so that uh, my anxiety attacks maybe lessen or go away. And they gave me some other pills, some vitriol or something like that, where um, uh, it can start working immediately. But it's not like a Ativan or a Xanax. It's not addictive and doesn't have any of the, those kind of side effects. Well, good. So hopefully I'm a little you know, uh, less likely to have these anxiety attacks from now on. Well, I hope so. Yeah. You still don't really... There was no reason for them, to your knowledge, or no reason for oh for the anxiety attack. Yeah. Oh, it's just everyday life. Mm. You know, the kids, uh, shit and piss coming through my ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to get one to work on time now. Um, right after I, you know, I get home at four twenty six, he has to leave at four thirty, 
yeah. you know, for work. But if there's a train, then, I, you know, just every little thing adds up. You know, my uh, youngest son got suspended. While I was in the hospital, I got a text message from my ex. It said, um, hey, uh, Colton just got suspended from school. And uh, apparently he threw a book and uh, a pencil. And the teacher said, if you do that again, you're going to be suspended. And he said, if you suspend me, everybody dies. Oh, okay. He went Tracy Smothers on him. <laughs> well. And, you know, 20 years ago, you could probably say that. And yeah. somebody would go, ah, that's a detention. Mm-hmm. Uh, not today. Not today. So there's more, you know, there's always some big amount of stress or anxiety in my life. Yeah. But I just wasn't handling it right. So I got gotcha. you. So I feel much better now. I, um, I'm ready to go. Good. Yeah. I'm glad so you're okay I today. I got the help that I needed. And uh, let's do this. While we're doing it, we're, we're, we're back in action. It's always weird to record intros without you. I got through it. We did a little short one last week. If you didn't listen to it, we I didn't gave you a little bit of an update on Aaron, or at least what we knew at the time. And uh, many people were concerned for you, just so you know. I, I think some yeah, people yeah, I, a lot of you. reached out, and I, I appreciate all that. And yeah. I read those. I, I did not read them, any of them, until I was actually in the hospital. Yeah. And then I, you know, once I started feeling better, then I could read some. But before that, I, I think I felt too much like shit. Gotcha. And I felt like I was letting people down. Yeah. And um, you're not letting anybody down, man. Yeah. yeah. Like you, the, the the first responses that I got from you, you know, were basically like, "I'm sorry." Yeah. And I'm just like, "Don't apologize." Just like you know, if you could, I would like for you to communicate, so I'm not just like getting a text like, "Can't do the podcast," and then I'm yeah. like, "Why?" And then just, you know silence yeah uh it's a little uncomfortable but you know everybody cares about you but we we sort of mentioned that about aaron last week and then of course our guest was bj colangelo who uh did you ever meet bj i'm sure you met nope. her at aiw right she nope. she helped work on that powerbomb movie and stuff nope uh she survived cancer yeah yeah i saw your um i saw the ads for for yeah. the show and uh you know and then you made a song reference, right? Scars. <laughs> uh, that wasn't by design. Maybe yeah. it was like subconsciously. Yeah. I didn't realize that I. You it, were quoting lyrics. From uh, a... It was it was Papa Roach, <laughs> and uh, BJ even commented on Twitter. Only you, Greg. I w- will allow to get rid of uh, using or get away with using a post about me with Papa Roach lyrics. And see, uh, and I, as soon as I saw that, I was going to tweet. Scars are souvenirs you never lose. Yeah. And that's a Goo Goo Dolls. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I so mean, I thought, how could I be worse than Papa Roach? No, Goo Goo Dolls, I feel like, ranks up higher than Papa Roach as yeah, far as, yeah. like, Well, for me, I like Goo Goo bands. Dolls better. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I like some Goo Goo Dolls, you know. Dizzy up the girl. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, of course, you know, we one of BJ's main points of her story, you know, sur- in surviving cancer is that Candice LeRae really inspired her to keep going with you know just her athleticism and her attitude and her classic match with the young bucks back in pwg and for the first time i don't know if you realize this i actually talked about briefly almost getting hired by wwe Uh this past year because you know candace played a big role in that and so if you didn't listen to last week's episode i encourage you to go back and listen to it and of course if you have a lot of time on your hands and you enjoy podcasts, you could go to patreon.com slash iron on wrestling where we have a buttload of bonus episodes, audio, video. We get very interactive on there with Zoom calls and you get to pick bonus podcast subjects and you get stuff in the mail, including next month in December. We're going to be sending out special care packages once again from Howard Animal Steel. So there is a lot to love over on patreon.com slash iron wrestling. In fact, you know what? If you've got a wrestling fan in your life that enjoys the podcast or a friend that you think should try out the podcast, why don't you buy them a subscription to Patreon for the holiday season? I mean, I think that's a great gift idea. You can just buy it for Thanksgiving. Why not? 
You know, if you don't want to eat their shitty turkey, <laughs> that crummy cranberry sauce. Okay. You know, you got somebody, you just buy them a subscription. Plus, they get a follow back on social media from Aaron and I, and all of this great content starts at just three bucks. And of course, the tiers go up and up depending on what you want. But for three bucks to get over 100 bonus episodes and early. We usually put up the show one day early, and it's usually extended, which is, will be the case with this one. We will be talking in a moment about AEW Full Gear because we try not to talk too much about current stuff over on the free version of the podcast here. So we'll, we'll be reviewing Full Gear. And uh, I, I feel like most of the details from Aaron's story will be left in this podcast. But uh, I don't know. We'll feel, feel it out when I start going to the editing process. There might be some extended details from Aaron's hospital stay. I don't know. I don't know what else we'll ramble about and sidebar about, but patreon.com slash iron and wrestling is the best way to get the full version of this podcast. And of course, coming up soon, we'll have the interview with Tony Deppen. But uh, before we go to that, Aaron, would you like to talk about AEW full gear? Yeah. Also, I I just want to mention that I had one friend that uh, came up and helped me while I was in the hospital because I was alone the whole time. Until I had uh, one friend, and I just want to give a special shout out to that person without saying their name. Say their name. No. Why not? Because I don't want to. Why? Because it's not important. Oh, you don't care about your friend? Nope. Your friend's not important enough to say their name? If you're going to keep talking, I'm going to fucking shut the whole podcast okay. down. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, it's a, hey, shout out to unnamed friend for their love and support. And... uh all right, without further ado, we will go, because Aaron just made me feel uncomfortable. We will go to uh, patreon.com slash wrestling where we're going to talk about AEW Full Gear. Aaron, are you ready? I am. Let's do it. If you're listening for free on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts, you just missed us talk for almost one hour about AEW Full Gear, and we, we did a lot of sidebarring as usual. Uh, we really dissected the pay-per-view, and uh, I think it's worth a listen. If you want to hear it, if you can't get enough of the podcast, of course, patreon.com slash Wrestling. starting at 3 bucks, You get to hear this bonus content. Plus, we're going to be putting up a bonus episode, hopefully this week, where we review for Sean Flash Robbins, one of our Patreon subscribers, the TV show Heels. This was something that you watched weeks ago, Aaron, and over the yes. past week and a half, I myself sat back and watched the show, and I don't know if any of our listeners have been watching the show, but Sean wanted us to sort of dissect the show, not only to see whether we liked it or not, because he thoroughly enjoyed it, but he wanted to get a wrestler's insight on the show. And so I turned my wrestler brain on, and I looked at some of the things in the program, and I definitely have a lot of things to say, and I will be saying that over with Aaron on Patreon dot com slash iron on wrestling starting at just three bucks what a deal it is a deal and i can't wait to hear your thoughts on it because i went into the show with a mindset of i want to just watch it as a fan yeah and you went in with the mindset of i'm going to watch it as a wrestler but but also I did not go in the mindset of I'm going to tear this show apart. No. So but but uh, there are some things that I find. Uh, I, well, I'm not going to go into it here. You got to go to Patreon if you want to hear it. It's uh, I think I got some interesting insight on this program. But you know I want to continue with the regular version of the podcast. I want to talk a little bit about Eric Ryan. Do you know the recent developments with Eric? No, I don't. Okay, well, I want to put this out there. And I think I've probably mentioned this to you in the past. Uh, Eric might even mention it himself when he was over hanging out with us a few weeks back when we did a podcast with him. For a while, basically the last two years, and it's definitely been going on for a lot longer in Eric's life, when we have hotel rooms together, uh, <laughs> I'm known as the guy that as soon as I close my eyes, I'm asleep instantly. People think it's weird as fuck, but I think my mindset is like, I think my brain overacts so badly throughout the day that the minute my eyes close, I'm just out. Like my brain has to shut down. <clears throat> Bobby Beverly and Eddie 
only get put in the same room together because they're huge snorers and annoy the fuck out of everybody. Snorters? Snorers. Oh. Jesus. What is, you, you are the crack addicted <laughs> one, man. You love the crack cocaine. They're huge snorers, and uh, everyone complains about their snoring. Not me, though, because I'm always unconscious and I don't hear anything. Uh, Ricky is Ricky, and he uh, occasionally talks to himself in his sleep and wakes himself up with uh, talking. Atticus Coger, I'm really not sure what he does. I mean, he he creates no problems for me, really. Mm-hmm. Nothing that I can think of. No one seems to be bothered by Addy sleeping. Eric Ryan, he can't bother anybody with his sleep because he isn't sleeping most of the time. Yeah. And that is because for a long time, Eric has been in incredible pain. And he finally went to the doctor and got some things checked out and... I'm going to read a, a few of his tweets that he put out earlier today as we record this. This would have been on Monday, November 15th. Eric tweeted, <clears throat> finally putting this out there, for the last six months or so, I've been battling tingling and numbness in my right hand. Now for the last three, I've gotten severe numbness in both hands to where I can't feel any of my fingers. It's been causing me to not sleep, waking up in... Let me go to the next. The most severe pain I've ever felt. It's severely hindering my QOL since basic tasks like opening a twist cap of soda is difficult. Getting surgery on my right hand Friday and the left in December. I'm unsure of my timeline out, but know when I come back, I'll be better than ever. I'll be out of work and wrestling for over a month. Zero work and wrestling means zero income. I'll be selling some old gear to help and get the BCA gear done and get that money donated as well. As much as I don't want to, I have to, so I'm going to put my info out there. If anyone wants to donate and help in my time out, I don't need, want, a lot. I don't need Dan Housen money, just enough to get by <laughs> and make sure I can get essential bills paid. Thank you all so much. And then he listed his PayPal, which is Eric Ryan Bookings at yahoo.com, his cash app, which is a money sign, Eric Ryan Wrestling, and his Venmo, at Eric dash Ryan dash 47. And what it comes down to is Eric is essentially getting carpal tunnel surgery done on both of his hands. And for a guy who is, I believe only 36 years old, it's way too young to be getting carpal tunnel surgery on both of his freaking hands. And Eric goes hard and, He's been in a lot of pain for a long time. Again, he said last six months with the numbness, but the pain has been longer than that Mm -hmm. because this this dude, he literally does not sleep. Right. Uh, Anytime I wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, dude is awake sitting on his phone or just sitting in the corner just by himself. And it's, um, it's gotta be torture. I can't even imagine. And so I'm only saying this to say, we want Eric to get well soon, and if you can help Eric with any of his bills, with any of the information that I just provided, his PayPal, his Cash App, his Venmo, do what you can. Every dollar helps. Like I said, he won't be working. He will not be wrestling, and uh, we just want to make sure that he can get by. Well, I second that. Uh, please, if you have anything to donate to Eric, do so. He's a good dude, hard worker, and a good friend. You know, earlier you did mention that you, you know, one of the only things you were able to do. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you while you're eating, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> you had it paused, so I took a chance. Yep. Nope. Well, I decided to unpause it. You mentioned that you got to watch Rocky while you were uh, under the weather in the hospital. I'm sorry. <clears throat> sorry. Local medical facility. I went to the theater. Mm-hmm. After Horror Slam, when I wrestled last Thursday, to watch the return of Rocky IV in theaters. But not just Rocky IV. Rocky versus Drago. Rocky IV director's cut. Oh. And you're probably thinking to yourself, oh my God. That sounds incredible. I mean, they probably added so much to the film. And Aaron, you'd be right. Did they? I'm going to give you some spoilers here. Okay. Like, you know how that one part of the movie where there was like a training montage Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then it was followed, you know, with a brief interlude with Adrian 
where she comes to visit him in Russia, and then yes. there's another training montage. Yes. They actually change some of the angles oh. in the training montage. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Like, for example, when uh, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, yeah. Rocky's doing pull-ups. That's all I remember. Uh, uh, yep. from, in, in the log cabin. Yeah, with the okay. beard. Yes. If you remember from one angle, yeah, they, they kind of like zoom in from the side and he's doing the pull-ups uh -huh. and they're getting close-ups. One, this one, they use an angle from the front. And they oh. don't zoom in. And he's just doing pull-ups. What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like pretty that. cool, right? And then, <laughs> I, I know you're intrigued. You're like, there's got to be more, right? Well, there's a part in uh, the early of, earlier video package. Like, remember when he's listening to No Easy Way Out? And he's, like, reflecting on everything from, like, the last three Rocky movies? Yeah. It's incredible, first and foremost. But secondly... I don't know if you remember that video package. When he flashes back to the earlier events of his life, mm -hmm. you know, it's all in color and stuff. Right. <clears throat> in this version, <laughs> you got to see it. They take all those same scenes that were in color, yeah. and it's in black and white. Whoa. Little artistic touch because, you know, it's a flashback. Why would it be in color? You know, he's thinking of his past. They made it black and white. That's unbelievable. Pretty cool. Pretty yeah. cool. Uh, so it was worth it? <clears throat> Well, you are probably also thinking, well, they probably really padded this runtime with the director's cut. So the original Rocky IV, it was one hour, 30 minutes. Yeah. This one, one hour, 36. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Six minutes of pleasure. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I will say this. One of the, probably the biggest central thing that they changed in the film, mm -hmm. which I don't know how to feel about it. Uh, the love story between Polly and the robot that he has gifted for his birthday. <laughs> yes. They completely edited out the robot. Oh, no. <laughs> the robot is not in the film. Oh, well, that just changes the whole complexion of, of everything. It really does. There was like all that sexual tension between Polly and the robot and it just not existent now. I thought they'd get married. Well, I mean, they should probably should have added that to the director's cut but they just cut out the robot i think sly wanted to make this version a little bit more serious okay but mind you he still left in 25 minutes of <laughs> video of packages yes yeah. so um but you know what i i did enjoy watching rocky four in the theater and because i'm such a a weirdo <clears throat> i had the whole day off work i watched the original version earlier in the day <clears throat> and i mean i had a lot of it committed to memory yeah. so it was easy for me in the theater i went and saw it with zach allen by the way because i was in detroit and so he brought his son along to nolan and we watched it and nolan was you know he's he's young so he was experiencing rocky four for the first time and he really enjoyed it but i quickly saw all the differences so basically the movie is just a lot of artistic changes like they developed the story between Rocky and Apollo a little more just to sort of uh, show the brotherhood between the two. Mm -hmm. But also, I think the best part of the movie, they extend the fights between Apollo and Drago and the final fight between Rocky and Drago. And honestly, watching the fights earlier in the day from the original and then watching them in the new one, they made the fights better. They, they give Apollo... Almost like a, he, he he had more of a, his defeat was less jobberish, yeah, I guess. Yeah. They, they they gave him more of a fight yeah. in this re-edited version. And then the version later with Rocky and Drago, they it's just a longer, more epic battle. And there was like little stuff that, again, for artistic reasons, I think Sly just edited out to make it more... I don't know, believable. Like at one point, there's a line where, and again, it's such a little thing, but it's almost like, you know, if we were going to go back and like overanalyze our performances as wrestlers, I think this is why I appreciate this edit, even though it is, when I told my girlfriend, when I told Nicole, oh my God, <laughs> I told her the same thing. Like the video package this time, the montage, black and white instead <laughs> of color. She's like, okay. And uh, you paid money for this? I'm like, yeah, $15. And I just like, uh, when Rocky's like seeing three of Drago and he's mm -hmm. sitting in the corner and he's like, 
Yeah, I'm seeing three of them. And then Polly says, hit the one in the middle. And then uh, if Apollo's uh, manager, yeah. that becomes Rocky's manager. He goes, yeah, yeah, hit the one in the middle. They edit him out saying that line because I feel like if I'm thinking in terms of Sly, it doesn't make sense for him to say that. Paul Paulie would say that, right? But he wouldn't say that. And they, st- you know, he starts. They edit it to where he's saying like, "No pain, no pain," and like giving him other advice. But he doesn't hit that line. I just mm-hmm. found that all very interesting. Just uh, there was also a documentary that you can watch for free on YouTube that Sly put out last week sometime. Just sort of going through the edits and why he's doing this, and it's almost like <clears throat> a free lesson in movie making from Sylvester Stallone on YouTube, YouTube yeah. which it, it just, I found all very intriguing. So I'm not disappointed that I went out of my way to watch Rocky four. In fact, I didn't tell horror slam why it was horror slam versus GCW. I didn't tell him the reasoning, but as I found out that the Rocky four showing was only going to be at 8 PM. And I knew that I was booked at horror slam starting at seven 30. I made sure to write the promoters and I went, Hey, I gotta be on first. I have a personal emergency I need to take care of. <laughs> and so they're like, okay. And so they put me on first. And of course the show started about eight minutes late. I was in a scramble match. And by the time I was done with my scramble match, I got to the back, looked up. I purposely <laughs> cause I wasn't taking the pitfall. I purposely booked my uh, ending of the match being oh and then me and another guy will brawl to the back yeah so then the, i knew there was gonna be like another 90 seconds of the match but every second counts when you need to get to the movie theater yeah. 15 minutes away i get to the back and look at my my phone time was 7 51 and i was like fuck 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 so i instantly just started changing down my clothes said my goodbyes told the promoters they could paypal me because <laughs> i wasn't waiting around <laughs> for my money and i got to the theater at about 807 so i was a little late yeah but uh, I I saw the majority of it and I was very happy about. It. In fact, I enjoyed it so much. I might just go on Prime and buy the uh, director's cut and watch it again. Wow! I'm a weirdo. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, that's where I'm, I'm at in my life. Okay. Well, um, I guess I'll try and watch it one day. You should. Yeah. It's not bad. Again, just for artistic purposes. But then uh, I had a bug up my ass sometime this weekend on the way back from GCW, and I watched. <clears throat> Rocky Five. Oh, okay. Because I wanted to view it again because I haven't watched it in a long time because it's notoriously known as the worst of the Rocky movies and it's still the worst. Yeah. I don't know the last time you watched it. Whatever the last time was, it was the first time. Okay. So when so did it come out? 1990. 1990. Oh, 1990. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um,. I don't know. I, I'd like some feedback from any Rocky fans or or, or uh, people that have watched Rocky Five. To me, Rocky Five almost feels like a made-for-TV movie mm-hmm. that they tried to get in theaters, but they couldn't, and they tried stuff that wasn't going to work, and it actually was released in theaters, and they did stuff that really didn't work. And in fact, you know, if you go back and watch Rocky Balboa, there was a couple plot points of that movie that just completely dropped, like Rocky having brain damage in Rocky Five. You know, magically in Rocky Balboa, he just doesn't. And then Sylvester Stallone tries to justify it when Rocky Balboa comes out. He's like, well, you know, uh, medical technology back then was different, right. and they misdiagnosed him. But like, they don't they don't really say that in, in Rocky Six. You know, they just kind of forget about it. So I would have too. But, uh, I mean, there are some nice little things in Rocky Five, like they bring back uh, the actor that played Mickey, and mm-hmm. they recut new scenes of, for, like, flashbacks for Rocky, so that was cool, because, uh, geez, what was, what's the actor's name? Do you remember? I don't feel like looking it up. Yeah, you're killing me. But here. he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, uh, Bur- Bur- Burgess, Burgess, uh, Meredith Burgess, Mer- Meredith Bur- Bur- is it Burgess Meredith? Either way. Okay, but he doesn't die till 1997, so they... You know, they had some time with them there to uh, bring them back for Rocky Five, So that was kind of cool. And uh, I don't know, man. No matter what, the love story between Rocky and Adrian is something that I'll always appreciate. And, God, even watching – I mean, Rocky Four was almost happening both times last week when I was watching. But Rocky Five, too, is just uh, – I get choked up and emotional because it mm-hmm. just feels so real. And there's something about – Adrian that if you're not emotionally invested she's not like 
conventionally overly beautiful, but I just think the way that she loves Rocky and if you're a fan of the films and you followed them on this whole journey, there's just something very that you've just fallen in love with. You know what I mean? It just it's uh, Look, when in the first one, when her hat comes off, it's over. Oh yeah. You know. I know exactly what you're talking about. But, but um I think Susan Sarandon was originally cast as as Adrian. You're correct. Okay, and they thought she was too beautiful. Yes. And they wanted somebody who was plain. Uh-huh. But I always liked Adrian's look. Yeah, she's she's great. Yeah, dark-haired girl. I I love in the first one you really start to get emotionally invested in them when they go to the the skating rink mm. by themselves. And yeah. you know why? They were by themselves? They didn't have money for extras. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you watch the same documentary I did? I've watched a lot of Rocky documentaries. <laughs> Me too. I enjoy Rocky very much. But, you know, it's great that we both got to see that statue at various points in our <laughs> lives, though, live and in person, right? Right. Oh, Oh, wait. Well, I yeah. did. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I... Too soon. Okay. All right. But, uh, hey, that's all of the randomness that I have going on in my life. I did GCW, 440. People were questioning whether 440 was still happening in GCW. It is. We were back. We were supporting Atticus during the Nick Gage Invitational this weekend. Didn't go the way that we would have liked it to go on. Jordan Oliver is a piece of garbage, but I'm sure he'll get his eventually. Jordan? Jordan. In the truck? No, this is uh, Jordan Oliver who lies about having injuries. We had beat the shit out of him the night before, Friday in Detroit. He faked a leg injury. I kicked his crutch out from under him. He did not fall down. Turns out he was okay. Then he beat the shit out of me with a crutch and super Bro, that's face. disgusting. I, it is. I, if you're in a fake being Middle finger emoji on that one. I'm going to send that one out. Yes, for sure. But uh, four four is back in GCW after a little bit of hiatus following war games, and we are stronger than ever. But uh, yeah, that's all I got going on. I guess I'm going to quit rambling, but uh, we probably should go and do some more rambling with Tony Deppin. What do you think about that? I'm ready for it. Hear some of his story, and so we're going to go to some commercials from our sponsors, and when we come back, we will be talking to... Tony Deppin. Aaron, earlier you talked about your recent visit to the local medical facility. What, were there other times that jump into the mind that you had to visit a local medical facility? Oh, like a hospital? I don't. I didn't think we were allowed <laughs> to say that word, but okay. Uh, I will tell you this one time. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. It reminds me. Um, about three years ago, four years ago, I had um, hernia surgery. Oh. I don't know if you remember that. I went under the knife. I do. I do. Okay. I had something protruding from my belly, and I felt like I looked like the Iron Sheik. Oh. You know how his belly button goes yeah, out like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's how mine had gone. I was an innie, and all of a sudden, I was an Audi. Yeah. And just got the piece of that umbilical cord still attached. <laughs> Get rid of that iron sheet. Come I, on. I kept thinking something might be wrong here. And finally I went to um, Nicole at work and I said, Hey, uh, you think something's wrong here? <laughs> I lifted up my shirt. She's like, Oh God, you have a hernia. So I went to the doctor's and I pulled my shirt up for the doctor and he went, Oh God, you have a hernia. <laughs> And they set me up for surgery. So I get to to the hospital or the local medical facility, if you will. And they have you, when they prep you for surgery, you have to get undressed completely and in a gown. So I put the gown on and I have nothing on underneath. Mm. And... Boy, the nurse comes in, and she says, Okay, you lay on this bed here. I got to check out. Are you freshly shaved? And I was like, why, why is this 60-year-old nurse asking me this? And I said, No. And she said, Well, doctor's going to be working down there. So we're working by, uh, below your belly button. Everything has to be shaved. 
I said, oh, uh, you have a razor? She said, yep, I got one right here. Zoom, zoom. And she pulls out these, like, hair clippers. No, what the fuck? And she starts shaving me down there. Oh, God. Now, if I had a product at the time, and if I knew of a product and could use it, I could have avoided this whole situation because, tell me, you know, would you have not been very embarrassed at this point? Listen, I wish that I could go back in time for you and give you <laughs> Manscapes Lawnmower 4.0 would have taken your embarrassment away. You know, it, make, it reminds me of when I went to the hospital for my groin injury a few years back in New Jersey. Oh, when Le- you broke your dick. Yes, legitimately. I had not taken care of business down there right. in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. And I had to show my bits to several nurses and mind you this is the one occasion in which none of the nurses are six years old they're all incredibly attractive to the point (laughs) where i had to apologize and i literally said ladies if i would have known that i had to show you this thing i would have taken care of it a little bit better and i apologize i wish that i would have had something like manscaped offers today inside the performance package 4.0 you'll find the signature lawnmower 4.0, of course, which is this electric trimmer with the proprietary advanced skin safe technology to reduce cuts on your nuts. And of course, it's also waterproof, so you can use it in the shower or in the sink if you're into that. And I mean, in the could, toilet, you, you can drop it in the toilet, it'll be fine. I don't know Not why. Not like my be, phone. Well, you don't want to do that. If it's pouring rain outside, you could go shave your balls outside don't recommend that that is technically indecent exposure so maybe avoid that yeah but o- only until it's shaven then it's a real decent exposure <laughs> okay uh the manscape performance package 4.0 in its entirety includes not only the lawnmower 4.0 but the crop preserver and crop reviver which is an anti-chafing ball deodorant moisturizer and toner And, you know, the holidays are coming early, so it's time to keep your North Pole feeling and smelling fresh. The hygiene bundle will also come with a pair of Manscaped anti-chafing boxers that'll keep your junk feeling fresh all day. It's the perfect perfect package for your perfect package. Manscaped is also going beyond the groin with the new Ultra Premium Body Wash. And Aaron, I know you haven't gotten the opportunity to try this out yet but i gotta tell you i'm loving the body wash and i'm loving the shampoo and conditioner it's a two-in-one and it's all infused with aloe vera and sea salt to keep your skin feeling clean nice and moisturized and the shampoo and conditioner is hydrating nourishing conditioning of the scalp and it's strengthening your hair at the same time it's pretty good you know i used to use head and shoulders i don't know if i'll be going back now that i got manscapes new two-in-one shampoo and conditioner well, I used to use, well, I won't even mention a product that I used to use, but I do know something. Something for Emily? The holidays won't be the only thing that are coming soon oh. if you use Manscaped 4.0 Ooh. and uh, the new shampoo and gel. Sort of inappropriate, but I'll go with it. It's fine. Really? <laughs> no, it's not. I, I was going to say, this it's is, this is more Iron than Iron Wrestling Podcast. It's more than appropriate. We've s- said worse things on this show. Presented program. by Manscaped. Tis the season to load up on Manscaped products. So get yourself, your dad, your brother, any of your friends, the best gift of all, the Manscaped Performance Package. And here's a gift for you. You use our promo code PARDON, P-A-R-D-O-N. You're going to get 20% off and free shipping. That's right. Promo code PARDON, 20% off, and free shipping. Ho, 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 gentlemen. The holidays are here early, as I mentioned, and it's time to invest in the leading men's hygiene brand, Manscaped. Do it now. Your jingle balls will thank you. See what I did there? Yeah, I saw it. All right. Now let's see what you got. No, I'm not I'm not showing you. Come on. No. No. Let me, let me just jingle those bells. No, no. Just take my word for it. Okay. You know, I've been wanting a new and unique t-shirt design for Christmas. Oh. But 
I don't know if I can think of anyone in particular that I should go to for said design or really artwork of any kind. Oh, I, I can think of somebody. I got a good buddy. Who's that? His name is Juan. What is it? Juan. He Come owns again? of the Ortiz Designs. No, I no, I know who you're talking about now. It's Juan Ortiz, and it's of the Dead Designs. That's right. Yeah, you know him too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know him because he's also a good buddy of mine, and he is a one-man merch design company, and he's created merchandise for some of the most prolific figures in all professional wrestling. I'm talking organizations like WWE, AEW, Ring of Honor, Impact, and New Japan Pro Wrestling. Guys like Ric Flair, Road War Animal, Hulk Hogan, The Young Bucks, Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy, even uh, yours truly. Nice. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's quite the man. What yes. a man, what a man, what a mighty good man that Juan is. And not only does he create incredible merch designs, but he just he does any type of artwork you want for any specific occasion. Now, with the holidays upon us, Aaron, I'm trying to think, there's got to be some sort of holiday scenario in which maybe you want some sort of artwork commission that you can get from Juan at an affordable price. Do you have anything that jumps to the mind when you think of something that you can get done as far as artwork for the holiday season. Okay. So it's Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. We're sitting around the table. Okay. I, pu- I, I want to preface this by saying I want this to be different than uh, a scenario that you've said in the past. Okay. If you could. Yep. So we're on a cloud. <laughs> this is, doesn't seem different at all. And we're at... We're at a, a, a long table, and it's Jesus is in the middle. Okay. Okay. And then on his right is you, and because you're his right hand man. Oh. Oh. Okay. No, no, no. I'm sorry. You should be on the left because you're more of a left hand man. Cause, gotcha. Because of yeah. You're, okay. So I, I'll way. be on the right. Also, at the table, seated at the table, we have um, an alpaca next to me. And a kitty next to you. Jesus. And then there's Jordan in the truck. Mm-hmm. He's got to be in, in there as well. And um, well, he could be sitting next to you. And then sitting next to me could be Uncle Bobby. Okay. All right. And then uh, no girls allowed. Okay. Wow. Yeah, because it's a uh, man Thanksgiving. Very sexist of you. Yeah, well, uh, they'll come in to play at Christmas time. So we have a turkey, okay? And it's, well, I don't know if you've seen this before. You, you remember The Last Supper? I've heard of it. Okay, well, this will kind of be like that. But we're all eating a turkey. And then you have mashed potatoes in front of you. And I have pumpkin pie in front of me. Okay. And um, everybody else has whatever else you eat, the gravy, the stuffing. Some people call it dressing. Um, Oh, and the N-word taker's there. Okay. Yeah, he comes in there and he starts rambling about no souls matter. Yes. All right. Also, that's his name that he gave to himself. I want to make that clear. Yeah, yeah, I didn't just... Do that. We like we like to refer to him as Soul Taker. Uh, he prefers the N word Taker. Right. Whatever. So we're all eating a meal, and suddenly there's a knock at the door. Yeah, and we open the door, and guess who it is? No idea. No, guess who it is? Uh, Jim Jim the Anvil Nighthard. No. What an he idiot. He said who? <laughs> I see what you did there. It's the bachelor, Ben Boone. Oh. Yeah, he's coming over. And he's brought a rose. This is in heaven? <laughs> yeah. We're all dead? <laughs> it's just a shirt. Okay. <laughs> Seems unnecessary to be dead, but all right. Maybe we're alive. Okay. Yeah. In heaven? (laughs) 
just go with it. Okay. So there we are. And then I start carving the turkey. And Ben Boone, he puts that rose right in the vase. Uh Uh-huh. And we all enjoy a wonderful meal together. Sounds nice. Yeah. One big happy family Mm -hmm. on a cloud. Why did it have to be in heaven, though? It was just on a cloud then. I, and an airplane is flying by. Okay. And on the airplane <laughs> are uh, all of our lady friends. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, they'd like to come over and and enjoy Thanksgiving dinner with us. They're, they're on the airplane? Like <laughs> yeah. in the airplane or on it? <laughs> they're in it. Okay. Yeah, and they're getting ready to land. Just making sure they weren't like on the wing or something, because yeah. I feel like that'd be very dangerous. Oh, are you a wingman? I like wings. Okay. I'd rather oh. have the drumstick than the, oh, the little yeah. thin, weird part. Do you, you like the gizzard? No. No. So you're not eating the gizzard? Okay. No, no. That's Benny Boone. He'll have the gizzard. Okay. We give that to him. Sure. Okay. And then these women get out of the airplane, and they're like, we slaved over this hot stove and made you guys this meal. Why did they have to cook? (laughs) They're women. (laughs) You just made it even more sexist. (laughs) What are you doing? And uh, so then they say, um, can we eat at the table? He's like, no, no, get back in the kitchen. (laughs) Oh, come on. (laughs) What are you doing? <laughs> Don't you remember how things were back when Jesus was alive? I guess. I mean, I wasn't around then. But also, why is this happening in heaven? <laughs> why is this being allowed? Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> I don't know if anybody even realizes at this point we're plugging of the dead designs. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait till he makes this shirt. <laughs> Oh, my God. How many will you buy? I don't know if I can. uh, uh, Like, women being put into the kitchen while we're sitting in a cloud eating food? And football's on. Football's on, okay. (laughs) I don't know what's happening uh, when I'm watching it anyway, so it's just, uh, I'll be very... No, you'll be on your phone, like you always are. (laughs) Okay, that's not true. Uh, God, I just had this discussion with Nicole. Well, at least you're not driving this time. All right. Of the dead designs <laughs> can create the merch or the art that you want, you know, for your friend or loved one or for the holiday season. It doesn't matter. He's open for all occasions. And if you contact of the dead designs, you mention Iron on Wrestling, you're going to save 10 bucks on your first piece of art. That's right. $10. So contact of the dead designs right now. Contact him on Instagram at of the dead 209 on Facebook at facebook.com slash of the dead designs or go to their website of the dead dot weebly dot com because of the dead designs is bringing your artwork to life. Tony Deppin, I'm going to pretend like I just didn't say hello to you. Like we weren't talking off air. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi, Greg. This is the first time we've said hi together today. <laughs> <laughs> you're just sitting at home hanging out with the kid and uh and he's about to fall asleep so that's nice yeah that's the highlight of my days is to give <laughs> some time to myself when he falls asleep for like an hour so he hasn't napped really much today so a lot of my time has been just watching what he's trying to eat or climb into so you're a stay-at-home dad during the week yes i am all throughout the week unless i have to like fly out on a Thursday or Friday or something like that. But other than that, I'm me and him every day. I would imagine you enjoy it a lot. I like, like I said, before we started recording, I can't believe the, the kids, you know, a year already. It's been, it seems like yesterday we we're just talking about the baby being born and the time flies. Yeah. I'd, I'd really like some time to myself though. Like, <laughs> cause I'm with him all the time. And then like, if I'm not with him, I'm wrestling. <laughs> and if yeah. I'm not doing wrestling, I'm at the brewery, so like, me time is not a thing that exists. Yeah, like, what is, what does me time look like for you when it does happen? Just well, I well, I I don't I don't count the gym as me time because that's part of the job with wrestling. Sure. But like, just being able to relax and not have to worry about what's going on around the house or like 
you know, stressing about something like I, like I'm, I never have any time to sit down by myself. Cause like I said, if I'm not wrestling and I'm at the brewery throughout the day and that's, you know, that's exhausting too. Cause it's like about an hour away from my house. It's not like right down the road. Yeah. So well, the, the brewery has been a big part of your life uh, for what the last uh, year or so now. Well, we've been shooting for this for the past like three years and then COVID hit and everything stopped and we lost our finances, but um, we've been open since July. So it wasn't as bad in like the, like the time leading up to it. But then we came, when it push came to shove, we're just like, we have to start doing stuff ourselves because we can't afford the other stuff that we need to do. So uh, we were there, like, I think around May, I just started getting like overloaded with that baby. Like I was at the brewery every day, like working on things, get home at like 11, one o'clock, between 11 and one o'clock at night, wake up, redo everything. And you know, it got, it got to me mentally and physically. So it drained the shit out of me. Yeah. Well, so uh, brewing beer started out as a hobby for you. And then how, how does it escalate to the point where you're like, I'm going to open up a brewery? Uh, my friends and I, we just wanted a homebrew because there's a homebrew competition. So we wanted to en- enter that. And then we got on some homebrew fest and we did fairly well. I think one of the first times we entered a competition, it was like the first time we brewed those beers too. We scored like a 37 out of 40 and on the stout and they're like oh yeah that would have won if uh you guys brewed it a few more times because the guy that won he brewed it like thirty thousand times and then our ipa we couldn't properly enter it and the, the judge was like yeah you guys would have easily won with that ipa i was like damn so then we started doing regular festivals and all that fun stuff and people were like oh when are you guys opening i was like maybe we should so here we are four and a half, five years later. That's wild. So what does a typical day at the brewery look like for you? Uh, well, I do a lot of the uh, finances and like the annoying things and I'll like, and I'll go to the brewery also like mainly out, like one of the only days like that I that's for sure always be able to go is a Thursday because wrestling isn't always happening on Thursdays. So like I'll go, I'll just kind of like, if we get our grain order in, I'll I'll load it down store to the basement, pack it up all around the area, uh, make sure the kegs are pulled out of the, the uh, cooler. And, you know, so we have room and get ready to situate them to take them to get clean. So a lot of just tedious tasks back and forth. I don't really work the bar much. Only when everybody, when we don't have other people available, then I'll work there. And that's the only time I, that's like literally the only time I make money from the brewery so far, because we're trying to pay off our debt first. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's got to be a pain in the ass. But I mean, uh, obviously, it's something you love. So hopefully in time, you know, it all pays off. Yeah, even if it's just like if it never blossoms to being like me making two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year and it's just like an extra forty thousand dollars a year. That's side money. Like that's a good throw that somewhere in investment or something like that. And then maybe I'll be able to retire one day. Maybe. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, speaking of, you know, making side money, wrestling for both of us for a long time have been side money, but for you, it's still a full-time gig now. And when you started around 2009 professionally, there wasn't a lot of money in professional wrestling. I, I don't miss those days at all. So it's nice that we can pay our bills with wrestling. So it's like, you know, you got to have a love and passion for pro wrestling when you're officially entering the business in 2009, but technically you started backyarding in like 05. Am I correct? Yeah. 05. And then I, all my friends, that were backyard wrestling they went and got trained and started doing indies like well i still want to wrestle so yeah i just jumped on ship with them and like you said like you have to have a like especially when you start uh, like years ago where there there wasn't money at the time now there's some money involved you had to be passionate about wrestling because if you weren't you were going to be fizzled out real quick because you didn't make any money like hell you I don't know if you remember, but you stayed at my house back in like 2011 because you guys needed a place to crash because there's no places to stay and you guys can't afford a room. Yeah. And I didn't know you. I've never met you before. Nope. And that's pro wrestling, trusting people with your, your bodies and in your home. I, I, I was going to ask you if you remember the first time I met, do you remember the circumstances in which it occurred? Yeah. Ricky hit me up because um, you and Marion Fontaine were going to Shikara and there is a crazy snowstorm and it ended up to the point where like, they have no place to stay. They don't want to drive through the night. And I was like, well, I'm like an hour and 20 outside of where they're running. I'm like, if they want to come crash, like the more, more than likely, I'm more than welcome to come down and crash. And like, I let you guys watch some of my WCW 
DVDs that I had because you guys yes. that's all I have because I don't ha I didn't have cable at the time so I was just like oh we could watch wrestling yeah no it was it was very nice that you let us stay there because we were fucked like literally I don't know if you remember we were about I want to say we we're about an hour from Chikara and Icarus calls me on the phone and he goes hey uh, Quack wants to know how close you are to the building did you leave yet and I'm thinking to myself the show is in like four hours of course I left we're coming from Ohio and I'm like yeah we're like an hour away and Icarus goes he's about an hour away and I hear Quack go fuck 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 and he goes yeah I um Quack can't use you guys tonight so uh you can just turn around and, and go home if you want and for me uh I was wrestling and then Fontaine was the next day so he was just gonna cancel Fontaine and I was like no, this, this can't be a thing. And so I had to be like, yo, you got to let Fontaine wrestle tomorrow. And I don't want to drive home. And, and even if we tried to drive to the Chikara show, they were closing off exits and stuff. Like it was, it was that bad. So you really saved our asses. And I would forever be thankful for that. Well, because Ricky messaged me and I was just like, yeah, sure. Why the hell not? Cause I've known Ricky for many years and you know, I was, and I just started wrestling and I was just like, oh, maybe I can make a connection. It didn't make a connection because we didn't talk about this for fucking like eight years after that when I started seeing you more often. But right. like, I just always like, and it still applies today. Like, uh, I always tell people, I'm like, if you're ever driving through central Pennsylvania, you need a place to crash. Like, you're more than welcome to stay at my place as long as I like you. If I, if I can't stand you, like, if I can tolerate you, you're golden. But if like, you're somebody I hate, mm, I'm gonna have to be like, sorry, man, house is full. <laughs> did, did you ever have any other random people stay at your house when you're sort of growing as a professional wrestler in those early years? No, because of where I live. I, you know, like where I lived there is different compared to where I live now. That was more northeastern Pennsylvania where I lived. So, like, not many people are driving through the area. Everybody, if you're driving through the state, you're driving centralized. Like, and you, you'll literally pass my house on the turnpike because I live like two minutes from the turnpike. What town did you grow up in? Shemokin, Pennsylvania. That's what I thought. I, I wanted you to say it to be sure, but uh, Shemokin, Pennsylvania, growing up there, I mean, what is life like in Shemokin? Poverty. Yeah. It's, it, it's like, because like you live in Cleveland. Do you, you live in Cleveland? Yes. And you could, it's a pretty destitute area. Like, it's not the prettiest. No. Now, like, and that's a big city. Now that, where I live in Shemokin is essentially the same way as Cleveland, except I think poorer because it's like way smaller. It's not by any big cities or anything like that. The, the average household medium income is like $18,000. Oh God. Yeah. It's like, that's why I was backyard wrestling. Cause I, I had nothing better to do. Like, and I remember when I told my mom, I was backyard wrestling. She's like, well, you're not doing drugs because a lot of people were doing drugs. And still to this day, that area has a lot of drugs now. <laughs> That being said, it's it has a lot of great people. Like you'll be there, and like I could take anybody out to the bar, and there will be people that are in that town. They'll buy you drinks left and right, and they don't even know you just because they're super nice people. And it's dirt cheap to drink there too. Yeah. So, what? and I've lived in big cities compared to small cities, and small cities always have nicer people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what what is Schmokin known for? If it had to be known for one thing, coal. Coal. It, it, it does seem like a lot of those smaller towns are, are coal miner towns. Like my, uh, I have a, my youngest brother, he grew up in West Virginia, junior West Virginia. And that's all that it's known for is just coal miners. If you don't end up working at the coal miner, you just get a shitty job at the local grocery store. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. They still think coal mining is coming back. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a coal filler there and they make like $8 an hour. People are just like, Oh, it's coming back. It's like, I don't want an $8 an hour job. No. They're coming and they work like 15 hour days and they come home and covered in black dust. That's, and it, it's a, it's a dangerous job too. Oh yeah. Like real bad. Like my, I think my, my grandfather uh, worked in the coal mines and it was like one of the most inspiring things I was ever told. I remember I was doing a tryout for OBW back when you can actually pay for tryouts to be seen by WB in like 2010. And I remember me and Matthew Justice stayed with my grandpa in Kentucky and my grandpa was just telling a story about how he worked in the coal mines and how he hated it and he wanted to work at Chevy and one day he just walked out of the coal mines and he looked at his dad who he worked with at the coal mine and just said I'm moving to Detroit and I'm going to work for Chevy and my grand my my great-grandfather thought he was crazy and he just 
packed up his shit that day and left. And I always thought that was like crazy because that was during a period of time when like, you know, me and Matt were closer and we're trying to do this wrestling thing. And as I said, 2010, that time period, no money in wrestling. So just it like sort of pushed me to be like, oh, maybe this thing isn't so unrealistic if you just go out there and try right i mean did you ever have anybody in your life like that like when you started telling them like you know you're, you're no longer backyarding you're trying to go pro did you have someone that wanted to push you to catch that dream uh honestly no i'll be i'll be 100 honest uh, I, I i i was just wrestling because i just liked wrestling and i enjoyed it if anyone i would have to say my wife because around 2000 15 after we graduated college I was like I'm just gonna be done wrestling like I'm, I'm not make I wasn't making any money ever yeah. I was making maybe the most I made at the time oh sorry the most I made at the time was like $25 mm. <laughs> oh, and that's uh, like seven years in like you know right so I'm like fuck this and she's just like you should just continue to do it she's like I really like watching you do it and I was just like okay I'll, I'll give one more shot and that one last shot led to a lot of things that being said like now I was always very confident in my abilities, but I always couldn't dedicate as much time as I wanted to wrestling because when I was in college, I was driving an hour and a half there, an hour and a half back, and then working 40 hours a week. I didn't have much time in my life, but I always said to myself, man, if I could dedicate more time to wrestling, I think I could do something. And like, that's something to me is like wrestle at Peter or a, a CZW, something like that, because I felt like that was like the time and that was like a pretty big deal. And now I started doing, like, I started hitting like CZW, I did Shikara, I did this, I did this, like, and I started thinking, I was like, man, I was like, I've hit a lot of my goals right now. I think I could, I think I could actually do something with this. Yeah. What do you think was your big standout moment that really started to change things for you? Uh, when I wrestled uh, Dustin Thomas at spring break. I, I love that match. I mean, obviously that, that story is dear and dear to my heart, but uh, I, I always feel like you are put in positions um uh, not only you're a great technical wrestler, but you're always put in positions to make people that might have some sort of, um, I don't know, hindrance, uh, make them look better. I mean, Dustin Thomas and like in a different level, and we'll talk about it later, your match with Ron Funches. I mean, obviously not a lot of experience as a wrestler, always a big fan, but like you're put in that position to make people look better. I think that's one of the great qualities that you have. Yeah. I'm, I think what it comes down to, I'm not selfish. Yeah. Like, and that's, that's a problem in wrestling today. A lot of wrestlers are very selfish. Like they'll go and wrestle the same person I wrestled and they might be able to do cool moves and be able to do a lot of things that are, that I can too, but the match doesn't resonate the same way because it's, it's like more of like a 75 or like, they're like 50, 50 in that match. Me, like when I wrestle those guys, I'm like, yo, 80% you, 20% me, let's work around this. Let's make sure everything's about you because that's what Brett asks of me. And that's what it comes down to. What I'm asked about, I'm, that's what I'm being paid for. And when I wrestled Dustin, uh, I was just like, I didn't care. Bro. Like, bro, I was like, oh, Tony, can you just I was like, yeah, sure, whatever, it'll be fun. And it blew up after that. And then after that complete weekend, my my messages, uh, my booking information just keep getting hit. I was like, damn, like constantly people are like, hey, I want to get here, I want to get you here, I want to get you here. And then uh, PWG message or emails me and I was just like, fuck. And I was like, this is cool. So yeah. it just That's all kept escalating to like, getting to the point I made so much money that I'm like okay time to bounce from my job because I was I couldn't I couldn't do both like that for too much longer because I was beating myself up really bad what were you doing for work uh, I was a service sales representative for Cintas so I would drive a truck around all the time and unloading shit loading like loading unloading you know packaging stuff and like I was working that four days a week because I'd work 40 hours in that four days and then Friday through Sunday I'd wrestle sometimes yeah. Thursday so like I'd get home Monday morning at 4.30 in the morning enough to shower and jump back in the car and go back to work. If they I'm, found out I was doing that, they'd probably fire me because it was illegal for me to not be driving or be driving a car under no sleep. That makes sense. And man, uh, so since the pandemic, I had to get a job again. So I was wrestling without full-time job for about two years. I was doing a little bit of the motivational speaking and the pro wrestling, but then when everything shut down, I had to get a job and I'm still working that job now. And it just seems like I I'm happy with the job. It's not ideally where I'd like to be, but I didn't miss those days of traveling all night, going right back to work. And it's like, you know, I'm at the point we're about the same age. I'm 35. You're what? 33. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, uh, this was cool to do when I was 25, maybe even 30, but 35, it's like, it, it's getting to the point where it's starting to catch up. Cause it's like, 
uh, you know, like you were saying, you never get you time. For me, I feel like it's nonstop too, because it's, it's actual job, podcasting, because that's being monetized, pro wrestling, lifting, because that's part of the job. And then, I, you know, you got to make time for the other people in your life to take care about, like my girlfriend. It, it's, it's rough. So for you to be able to quit that full-time job and get that opportunity, uh, that's a great thing. Yeah, I, I was very, like, alleviated because, like, I was so stressed out doing that constantly. And I burned through all my PTO time just because, like, I was just, I had to, like, sometimes my flights would get canceled or something like that. And, like, I was just super stressed out. And I was sitting in a, at a meeting at work. And, like, I was like, I fucking hate my life. I was like, this sucks. So I text my wife. I was like, I can't fucking do this anymore. I'm like, I'm miserable. They're like, I'm going to drive this fucking truck off a cliff or something like the O'Doyles did in fucking Billy Madison. <laughs> yes. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did. She goes, just, just quit. <laughs> and I go, are you sure? Because, you know, that's not always guaranteed. And she's like, just quit. I was like, fuck it. So like she said that to me and I text my boss. I was like, yo, can I talk to you? And he's like, yeah. So I drove back to the, the depot. I was like, here's my two week notice or I gave him a month notice. And he's just like, oh yeah, right. I go, no, nah, I'm serious, dude. I'm out of here. He's like, oh, so I got you for a month. I was like, no, Tuesday I leave for Japan for two and a half weeks. So you've got me for like six days. Wow. He's like, oh, okay. And like, I like, cause everyone always messes me like, oh, what do you, what'd you do when, you know, you quit your job. I legit hit the ground running. I legit contacted anybody I could about bookings. And like, I just, and I was like, at right after that, I, like, I remember in October, I did 21 matches. Like I was home like four days or something like that. And like, I was wrestling Thursday through Sunday. Cause I would do beyond and I'd go straight to like, I'd end up on the West coast somewhere and get home late Monday morning or something like that, you know? Yeah. That's, I, I, I'm inspired by the courage just to go and just go, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to quit because uh, for me, similar situation before I started wrestling full time, it was like, um, I, my job was not going to give me time off. I, I was working with adults with developmental disabilities. So I love the job, but they would not give me time off to go to do a speaking engagement in Brownsville, Texas for like four days. And in those four days, interacting with kids from, uh, high school transitioning into college that was sort of the goal to sort of set them up for that uh i was gonna get paid as much as i would in like six weeks at work and so but i had no more pto time and so long story short i my girlfriend at the time was like just quit and i was like i can't just quit like that's crazy and she's like just pad your wrestling schedule and you have this speaking gig and maybe you can get another speaking gig and you'll be good and so I don't know what you did to network, but I already had some bookings. And then you ever see that indie, indie wrestling calendar that Philip Stamper makes? Yeah. Dude, that was like a lifesaver because I just looked at what I already had booked and then I saw the stuff around it and I was like, okay, let's fucking do it. And I started padding bookings together. And then before I knew it, I was like, well, I told my job, hey, I'm going to Texas for a week. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And I, I said, if you guys want to fire me, and fire me but i'll come back on monday and i'll work if you want me to and tony spoiler they didn't want me to work on monday so it was off to the races with pro yeah, wrestling man the day i quit like my last day there like uh, i was flying out to san francisco for a show i wake up friday morning san francisco time so it's like five or six i got a call or something like that so nine o'clock back here it's my boss he goes where are you Go, yesterday was my last day he goes, since when? i go since last month when i put the month notice in right i was like so good night i'm going back to bed and it's hung up on him that's i i love every bit of that but you know so you talk about wrestling full time one of the things that i was really pumped about when it happened for you was the opportunity in ring of honor and you worked there for uh quite a bit and you became the tv champion despite not being signed. So my question to you is obviously Ring of Honor just closed. And so there's a lot of people out of contracts. Uh, I guess two part questions. A, were there ever talks of officially signing you? And B, how do you feel about the current situation with Ring of Honor closing down? And do you think they'll, they'll actually come back? Um, there were talks of, to be honest, right before this all shut down, like the, when the news broke that Tuesday or something like that, I can't remember. I was told that leading into that week because that week we were doing tapings that that's when something was be offered to me 
because everybody's contracts are expiring, set and expire. So that's when they're going to officially offer me something so we could start like, you know, negotiating. <laughs> so good timing, right? Yeah. Um, uh, about them cl- coming back. I, fuck if I know, dude, like they're not telling us anything. I have my thoughts on what they might be doing, uh, but I don't, I don't know if it's accurate. Like some in, in the back of my head, I think this was just a, like a fire sale really quick. Like, Hey, let's do this fire everyone. Then we can't, then we won't get attacked for firing just one person. Mm. What's going on. We'll fire everyone. Yeah. Reevaluate in April and then maybe start signing people again. I don't know. They say they're not signing anybody. That's what they were told, but I don't know. Like I have a feeling like that's one thing they want. It'd be a safe. It was. It'd be a safety net for them if they would do that. Just fire everyone at once. Yeah. You know, and then just say, "Sorry, guys. You know, problems with the company." But then come back and then sign the people that they wanted to keep. It it definitely came out of nowhere. But I mean, I guess in terms of like you know, Tony Depp and teenage Tony Depp, and I imagine you were a big fan of Ring of Honor. So to sort of not only be a part of Ring of Honor, but to be one of the final TV champions. I mean, that's. That's got to be like a mark out moment for the kid in you, right? Yeah. See, like, uh, Delirious, he's the booker. Everyone knows that. And I remember when he, or it was kind of like a backtrack thing, but like when I was talking, because I, I wanted to have a conversation with that after I found out everything happening with the company, he's like, Tony, I'll be honest, nobody wanted you to have the belt. He's like, I fought for them to give you. He's like, I was making, I was like, no, let's put the belt on. It'll be good. And they're like, oh, I don't know. We, he's not contracted. We don't know him, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I fought tooth and nail. He's like, because I could see the passion that you have for wrestling and just the way that you ever, and he's like, in the way you're talking to me right now, Tony, like, I, I realized it was a really good idea. And when I won the belt technically back in March, but it didn't air to like May. And so in March, I, I knew I was wrestling hot sauce. But I was like, I'm not contracted. I'm not winning. Like, I was like, I was being realistic. Hunter pull, or Delirious pulls me to the side. He's like, so can uh, you confirm you'll be here for May? I was like, yeah, sure. He's like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, so you're telling me that it doesn't matter the May dates. You'll be here. I go, yeah, no problem. He goes, okay, congratulations. You're up. And I'm just like, wow. And I had my mask on because we, we were required to have a mask on. If he would have... If you have seen me with my mask off, I had like the biggest grin on my face and like, yeah. and then I won the belt and like, we had to keep our mask on after the match too. So like, I went in the back, just threw a towel over my head and just like put the belt in front of me. It's like, holy fuck. Like, yeah. What a moment. And, it, and my wife thought I was going to lose as well because, you know, she was aware that I'm not contracted. So like, and before I was leaving, I was like, Hey, uh, who do I give the belt to? Because like, as, as every time I won an independent belt, they're always like, Hey, give us the belt back. I was like, who gets I'm like who, who do I get the belt to? They're like, you take that home. I was just wow. Like, what? I was like, cool. So I took a picture of it when I on my bed at the hotel and I sent it to my wife. And she's like, what the fuck? And I was like, yeah. I was like, they put me up. I was like, that's, what the fuck? That's awesome, man. And I'm glad that Delirious could see how passionate and how hard you work. But I think also, I mean, you probably saw what an incredible technician you are in the ring. And it, it always surprises me because like you weren't formally trained like you didn't go to an actual wrestling school right uh, now nah, i got i got trained by andy and arbo just sitting in a, in a church <laughs> a random church yeah so so like uh, there's nothing formal it's like hey guys this is how you bump this is how you run the ropes it wasn't like i see what people go through and i'm just like nope i didn't i didn't have to bump 60 times just to get it right yeah it, it, it just it, it amazes me because and i've talked about it on the show in the past it's like you know when we were coming up there was always this stigma about backyard wrestling being this horrible thing but fast forward to 2021 uh, the majority of pro wrestlers definitely backyard wrestle and i would argue that backyard wrestling really sort of changed the style of pro wrestling as we know it today would you would you agree with that oh hell yeah i remember uh i think like 2011 12 ish i would go to backyard shows still and like they would start out like a match with like super kick, like boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, man, what the hell is this? Like, that's not how you. That's not how I wrestle. <laughs> Fast forward like two years, three years later, I started seeing like all of that just get intertwined. I'm just like, holy shit! It all came full circle. 
Yeah, that's uh, man, it's, it's interesting. I, I never really got into backyard wrestling because I had a bunch of friends that just were terrible at backyard wrestling, and also I got back dropped on my neck. So, I, I uh, we had a period of time where we did backyard boxing, which was even we, worse. I've done than, that before. Really, have you? It was oh, yeah. not fun, terrible. <laughs> it was we not doing backyard, we were doing like a basement or something like that, like, <laughs> yeah, and we'd record it. I think, I think I have some backyard boxing uh, a tape laying around somewhere. Maybe I should put it on the internet at some point. So I, I might have to view the commentary just to make sure oh, that yeah. no one's going to get canceled because we're oh, talking yeah. 2001. Uh, <laughs> two, yeah, teenage kids. That, that is uh, not a good situation. The, the Tony Depp in the character, though, uh, obviously, you're very mild mannered to talk to outside of the ring. But like, how did you find the Tony Depp in that we know as an in-ring performer? Um, so I think it's like a mix between working small shows that got me like the, uh, the snarkiness that, I, that does come out of me and stuff like that. But I also, um, at the one GCW show that I won a belt, the ref fucked up on something and I was heated. Like I was so fucking heated. I, like I'm stormed in the back and smart Mark comes up right behind me like, Tony, cut a promo and I was so pissed off that I turned around and I just started flipping out like going nuts like and it stops and Janelle goes like Tony just be like that all the time he's like doesn't matter if you're a healer face just be that way and people I think people do if like you actually sit down there sit down and talk to me about wrestling like a, as a person you'll see part of Tony Depp and Carriage come out because like I'm very passionate about wrestling so like when I see something that's really bad I'm not afraid to like voice my opinion like that fucking sucks like you need to get better or something like that. like it's something that, that I've I've given my entire adult life to and for people just to treat it with disrespect it bothers me so like I think it's a mix of like a character but also it's also just me like magnitude is that magnitude that eh, magnituding my uh passion about wrestling to like about a million you know, because it's yeah. what I love. Like it's all it's all I'm it's all I've ever been good at, to be honest. I suck yeah. at most other things. I feel like I always say that I'm very I'm good at a lot of little things, and then I take a lot of those little things and then it created the illusion that I'm good at this pro wrestling thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a sprinkle of everything, like this hodgepodge of things, and just like, oh I get yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm not amazing at what I do. I'm just solid at what I do. And I feel like people can see the passion, you know, oh. zoom through me. Like, and that's where a lot of guys that came up in our time, you know, they're passionate about wrestling. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not here for a fucking quick buck. For sure. That's for sure. Yeah. We're here for a quick buck. We would have been gone. We, we, our bodies would be feeling normal. Yeah. 100%. You know, the way you talk about being passionate and you get pissed off when you see something that just isn't good and you're not afraid to tell guys like, yo, that isn't good. Uh, that sounds like um, almost like a teacher mentality. So like, you know, who knows how long your career will last. I'm hopefully a long period of time. Uh, do you think like after pro wrestling though, you could see yourself doing something like being a producer an agent or something like that, like helping guys get better because I feel like you're good at a lot of little things that make the big picture good for other guys. Uh, I honestly don't know. Like I love performing so much that I don't know if I could even just like stand around and watch not be able to wrestle. Like I've been to shows as a fan since I've been wrestling, like, cause I would like GCW run like a triple header and I'd only be on like two shows. And I'd sit there. I'm like, I don't even want to watch this. Like this is like, like it's irritating to sit here and not be able to wrestle and yeah. then see like something happen. I'm just like, I could have put on a better match. <laughs> I get that aspect of it though. Too. I, I always think about how, um, I don't know, for me, it, I think it's a little different because with the disability, I always feel like, um, you know, training with Gargano, I could never keep up with all the moves he was doing. So I had to learn real quick to figure out psychology and yeah. timing and positioning. So I always say that I have a better wrestling mind than body. So I, I'd like to think that after wrestling for me, maybe doing producing or writing or something would be something that's beneficial. But, you know, I, I could see you doing something long term, just staying in the ring because it's sometimes it's hard to step out of that spotlight when you know that you still have, you know, the ability to compete at 110 percent. Yeah, like and like you said, you have a better mind for us, and because of your uh, physical limitations, like that is the way. Like I can do some stuff, but I'm I'm not like 
I'm not super athletic and I'm obviously not the biggest person. Yeah. So I always had to kind of just like, well, let's try something different. Let's like, let's do this instead of that. Let's learn this. Like, let's make sense. Like let's string things together. That's going to segue into something that makes super sense for you or something like, like it, it all came through time of just wrestling and like, just being a realist i'm not out here like i never thought i was gonna make a wwe i was just like well, let's let's make the best of what i can get like i always told myself i want to put 100 percent to wrestling regardless of where i was wrestling or how many people i was in front of so like i'm always in that mentality it's so always gonna go hard always gonna always gonna try my best because wrestling deserves it you know and the people that paid for their ticket they deserve it regardless if five people paid for ticket or five thousand people paid for that ticket Hell yeah. You know, it always goes back to being selfless. And, you know, you talked about how you're working with Dustin Thomas earlier, and and uh, I guess we didn't really mention it. Uh, for those that don't know, Dustin has no legs, so that's what makes him different and unique. And the fact that you were able to, you were willing to take moves from him and look like a dumbass, uh, that's a testament to who you are as a performer and as a character. But fast forward, though, one of the most prominent things you've done as of late was you had a few with comedian Ron Funches. <laughs> Tell me how that all gets set up. Uh, that was just, so I did um, literally the anniversary of me and Ron fucking around each other, probably six. I saw in my memories. Uh, we, I did his podcast, Getting High Watching Wrestling. And uh, I had some server issues because like I, I, my computer's a piece of shit. So like it's, it wasn't updated properly to get into his thing. And he's like, let me, what's your email address? And I'm like, I have a Hotmail address still because as, hey, if I get emails, I don't care. And he made fun of me about it for the longest time. And like, he kept shit on like randomly, just he'll take, he takes stabs on me randomly online. And then I said something and some people actually thought we were serious. And he, like, I messaged him. He's like, yo, do you really like, you want to try something with this? He's like, do you think I get anybody like to do this? I was like, we could get GCW to do it. And we just kept at it. And the one day Brett messaged me, he's like, Tony, do you not like Ron? What's going on? I go, Oh no. I'm like, I was going to talk to you about getting this to be a, like a legit thing. And he goes, really? He's like, let's, Let's do it. I love that. That was so you end up doing the thing at what it started. The the last final build to the match happened at War Games, I believe, right? Didn't Ron do something after your match with Alley Catch? Yeah, the art of war, I think it was. Um he was like I just told him like to don't like bury me on the commentaries, but just like talk. You know, like just don't be too nice about me. And leading in like I remember like a month prior to that, I was supposed to be in uh la and my flight got canceled and there was no way i could get there on time and stuff like that and he legit like made a laughing stock of the fact that i missed flight missed a payday and stuff like that and he kept running his mouth so i was like just keep talking dude i'm like and i'll just say you can't you can't stop running your mouth about me and i called him out and then i was like and i'm gonna smack you just so you know <laughs> like i'm not holding back like if you if you're stepping in if you're stepping in wrestling i don't care who you are i'm gonna I'm going to serve you the same way I'm serving the wrestlers. You don't want to look like an idiot. No, I'm going to be safe, but it's just, I'm going to hit you. Like, it's simple as that. And I hit him. He's like, damn. He's like, what? He's like, that fucking hurt. I was like, I told you it's going to hurt. <laughs> it was safe though. Right. And, and I think that it popped the crowd, but it also popped Ron's ex-wife. And that was a hundred percent legit. I, was, I, I know it was like, I could tell it was legit. Or wh why else would you post it? Like, uh, talk to me about the reaction you, you felt inside when you got a DM from I, literally Ron shoot ex-wife. I, I, I got the, I got the DM. It was through my Facebook uh, fan page. So it wasn't even through like Anthony Depp and like my face or my real Facebook. Right. And my response, when she sent the message, I go, wait, what? What, what, what did the message say? Hold on. <laughs> pull it up. I'll give you a second to pull it up because it's uh it's absurd. And it all goes back to it's like I'm sure when she was with Ron, she probably made fun of him for like liking this quote unquote fake wrestling bullshit or whatever. And then for <laughs> you, it's hard to blur the lines between reality and fiction. Let's see here. He's pulling it up. You gotta find this stuff. Oh, all good. Right, here we go. Here Where's we go. Uh, he said, she says, good morning. Unfortunately, I'm Ron Funch's ex-wife. I appreciate you seeing through his charades so much. I'm now one of your biggest fans. He's one of those, the most insecure, petty people I know. So a professional wrestler not liking him will deeply bother him. Take care. And I go, wait, what? She goes, where are you located? And she goes, never mind. So I think she's trying to like, either like 
get oh. with this girl I was married. And then she's like, never mind. I'm Ron's ex-wife and he's the worst. Anyways, you got a new fan. Sorry to bug you. That's amazing. <laughs> I legit, I legit messaged Ron right away. I go, uh, is this real? And he goes, unfortunately, yes, Tony. He's like, there's a reason why she's my ex-wife. Clearly. Yeah. I was just like, like that was something. <laughs> well, talk to me about putting the match together with Ron and, and also Paul Shear was involved, right? Yeah, I got a call when I was down at Ring of Honor tapings from Ron. He's like, can I give you a call? I want to talk to you. Sometimes. I'm like, yeah, he's like, uh, I'm going to have Paul Shear there. And like, I didn't watch the league, so I don't, I don't know anything about anything. Right. And I was like, okay, that sounds cool. And he, he told me, like, he's like, I want all these people to be like Dan Howes and Paul Shear to be in, like within the match. And I'm like, okay. I was like, but I was like, I'll like, I'll play somewhere they're going to be at. So, and I was like, okay, we're gonna have Dan House and make the save. I was like, then, then Paul's gonna turn at this point, and then this, that, like, so it was a lot of like just me, like I was like, let me do everything, let me organize everything, and then like the Canadian Destroyer came about, and he's like, I don't know if I could do it. I was like, fucking jump. I was like, I'm gonna, do. like I am gonna get over with this, and I jump and I fucking, it was the best Canadian Destroyer I've ever taken, and he's easily has 150 pounds on me maybe because he's i think he's like 300 pounds sure and he hits that canadian shore he sits up and he goes yeah and i go pin me and he goes sorry <laughs> he was so excited he didn't think he's gonna get it either i love it man and would you say that that's the the most surreal absurd match you've had in professional wrestling oh yeah that well, well minus wrestling out with no legs yeah like it's pretty ridiculous but it was just cool like and it was it was real easy it wasn't hard like i had fun with it so, yeah. I, like, would I do it again? Hell yeah. I got a nice payday. I got an extra, a bonus because I sold a bunch of IP reviews for it. Love it. That's, that's awesome, dude. It, it's, uh, it all goes back to, again, being selfless because you understand as a performer that doing stuff like that, like making a comedian look like a million bucks is inevitably just going to be better for you. He legit wanted me to uh, job him out real quick. And I go, hey, bro, if uh, Bam Bam Bigelow, who is one of the greatest in my eyes, can bump for LT, I'm bumping for Rod Punches. Yes. And he's like, no. okay. He legit wanted me to come out, punch him, like hit him with the knee, go home. No, that would okay. that, that could, the crowd would have been pissed. Yeah. So I was like, see, then they would just they would have looked at it as you looked at for a PR stunt. And you didn't really love wrestling. I was like, go out there and actually try to perform. They're gonna have so much more respect for you. Yeah. No, they 100%. did. A lot of people were like, you know, it wasn't the great, it wasn't gonna be the greatest match, but like I respect that Ron went out there and gave it his all. Yeah. No, that's really awesome, man. Yeah, we didn't even touch on it. You know, you started watching wrestling in what, like '91, right? Yeah. What What, what was your? Uh, who were your favorites growing up? Uh, obviously, growing up, Ultimate Warrior, Hulk yeah. Hogan, Randy Savage. Uh, Mid '90s, I I was more like a, a Diesel, Bret Hart guy. But like my all-time favorite wrestler, like, and just because like I I knew I was never gonna be big was Dean Malenko. He's always been my favorite wrestler of all time. I always gravitated. Like, I always, like, obviously, everybody has their top heavyweight guy, but, like, I always got excited about the cruiserweights or the light heavyweight division. That was always, like, when they would be on, it, like, oh, yeah, here's, we're going to see some awesome stuff, and, like, the wrestling's going to be awesome. Like, so I always gravitated towards, like, really good wrestling. It was always something to me. Yeah. I remember we had a GCW show, and John Carlo goes, Tony, who's your favorite wrestler of all time? I go, Dean Malenko, and Brett goes, I fucking told you. <laughs> like, they are just taking a guess on who my favorite wrestler was, and apparently they said Dean Malenko. So ridiculous. Well, you know, uh, Malenko was incredible, but you know, uh, Gargano, he, he, his mom used to make him costumes when he was a kid. And so she had him uh, like, like a Rocky Maivia costume. Uh, like we're talking like Rocky 96, right? Yeah. And he With had, fucking, a, yes. Yeah, almost like the Jeff Jarrett-esque look. Yes. Thing. Yes. And then uh, he had like a Shawn Michaels costume, obviously, but he also had a Dean Malenko costume. I remember thinking like, what? Like what kid asked their mom for a Dean Malenko costume? Like he was cool. But like, yeah. I don't know if I would have asked for like a Dean Malenko vest and like a little pair of trunks. I don't know. This is weird to me. I would have. I I just always loved him. I wish uh, his health was better. Yeah. I would, I would like to meet him one day. Like I know, like I've been told from a few his health isn't the best, which right. is unfortunate. Yeah. But like, I would love to meet him at least once because legitimately he's like my favorite wrestler of all time. And just if, if he were still able to wrestle, I would be like, I would be like, Brett, I'll, I'll wrestle for free if you let me wrestle Dean Malenko. 
Yeah. Fucking like, I'll, I'll job within five minutes too. I don't care. Right. It's, it would be a dream come true outside of Dean Lincoln. Have you ever met someone that like almost reached the pinnacle of what Dean was for you? Like, as far as like meeting your heroes? I don't think I, what sucks is like, I've never met a lot of the guy, like maybe like great, great Sasuke or Masada Tanaka. Okay. I, I've always wanted, like, Taka Michinoku is up there. Is like, he's, like, my second favorite of all time. Like, I love Taka. Yeah. And I remember one time Brett was trying to get shit organized for a show, like, during an all-out weekend. And he was going to be there. Brett's like, who do you want to wrestle? I was like, Taka. And he's just like, let me reach out to him. And they reached out and they're like, nah, he doesn't want to do any of those shows. Damn. That sucks. So, like, that's always, like, if I got a chance to, I'd be, like, so pumped. I, but I guess I got to wrestle great Sasuke in Japan. So, like, yeah, it, it's a win-win. But like, I've never met one of those crews. Well, I met like Hoovy and stuff like that. But I never really got to meet someone that I'm like, like a Dean Malenko status to me. Like, I I would prefer to meet Dean Malenko over Hulk Hogan any day of the week, to be honest. And that's I mean, not me saying because Hulk Hogan's canceled. Like, I just I have so much respect for Dean Malenko. Like, I have best of '80s in Japan Dean Malenko DVDs and such. What's your favorite Dean Malenko match? I know, I know. It's a hard decision there. You know, I, I'm going to pick one that I think a lot of people forget about. I think he had an incredible match that you often didn't see in the WWF. Backlash 2000 versus Scotty Too Hotty. Do you remember this match at all? No. Go back and watch, watch it. This. Go back and watch it and tell me what you think I, because gonna, it's crazy. I, I kind of fizzled out in WWE around that time because I was kind of bored of it. I, that's when yeah. I started really getting heavily into the independence. I'd just say anything with... Like, I loved his matches with Rey Mysterio. Like, I don't know what – I couldn't pick a single favorite. Like, they would go to Nitro, and they'd have a banger. They'd go to freaking Hog Wild or and have a banger. And it's just like, damn. It's like yeah. – I, I just loved – like, every – like, he wasn't the flashiest guy, but I feel like he was a selfless person in the ring. Like, he made sure that, like, Ray or Hoovy got over immensely. Yeah. Like, yeah. And he just – he did – he the spots he did hit were clean as fuck. He made sure his stuff counted. And that's the way I am. Like, I make, I'm not going to do a million things, but I make sure all of my stuff that I do do counts. 100%. And you know what? Uh, we're not going to mention the promotion, which it occurred, but, you know, during the COVID pandemic, the, uh, the beginning of us coming back to shows, my first match back was against you in Jersey. And we had wrestled briefly in a scramble in Texas. I was yep. so happy that got to happen. But just the fact that we got a one-on-one -on -one match and I got to experience um, myself you know, what a great technician you are and just how good you are putting stuff together. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better match back in professional wrestling. I will say I was overly sore because it was the first time in 14 years that I hadn't wrestled for four months. So I was really feeling it the next day, but I was thankful that I was in there with you. I, I remember my first match back after COVID, I wrestled Shane Mercer. Oh God. Okay. And like he went to give me a beal and I was like, I'm just gonna take the bump. I want to take it. And like Shane's so strong that you didn't get to di dictate your bump. No, I went flying and like I hit and it was like so hot and exhausting. And, like I hit that mat and I felt my hip shift and I'm just like, oh my fucking god, that was terrible. Like because for 15 years of my life, I was wrestling every week. And some like whether it's the backyard and we had a ring in our backyard. So it wasn't like we were wrestling on a mattress and we were wrestling in a ring for 15 years straight. And that's the first time in months. I think the longest time I went prior to that was probably like three months without wrestling. Yeah. Did, did you ever, I know like right now, Eric Ryan is going through some shit with injuries and Chris Dickinson, who you were with, in, you know, in that group with in ring of honor, he's going through some stuff. What was your worst injury that you've been through since pro wrestling started for you? Um, I tore my meniscus, but I just didn't get it fixed. I thankfully have never had anything serious. Like right now I have a lot of nagging injuries, so it's uh, really hindering me to actually lift weights. Like I haven't really lifted weights in like three weeks. Oh, wow. Because like my shoulders completely messed up. I just do, I'm just doing cardio for now. Cause I don't want to hurt myself. Sure. Like, even when I do like squats with weights, like I'd feel some pain in my shoulders area. So I'm like, and like, I saw the personal trainer at ring of honor. And they're like, you just need to take some time off. Like, like for lifting weights, like that's your problem. Like there's nothing broken. There's nothing ripped or anything. It's just that. So I just been doing cardio and abs and I'm like, cause like, 
I'm going to be 34. So doing this not as frequently as I was kind of hurts more than if I were doing it four times a week. Right. So going like sometimes doing three times a week, sometimes doing one time a week. So I was like, okay, that's start like it adjusts on your body and stuff like that. And, you know, the styles are getting more car crashy and, you know, yeah, you got to be careful, especially if you're yeah. going to do this long term. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to keep you much longer because I, I, I know you got the baby there and you got to go to the gym in a little bit. and You got to get that done. And I understand all that. But do you mind if I hit you with a couple uh, rapid fire questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm a nurse. My wife took some overtime today, so she, I, I'm not going to the gym until like eight o'clock tonight. Now. Oh, OK. OK, well, um, I'll still I'll still keep it short for you, though. I, I, I appreciate your time. But um, off the top of your head. What do you think is the worst match you've ever had in your career? Oh, I don't know if I could say somebody's name. You don't have to say their name, but you can kind of lay out the scenario why it was so bad. Oh my God. So uh, this, this kid came in, he's talking a big game. He's like, this is only a few years ago too. He's like, I wanted to wrestle you again because I want to prove to myself. I made sure I didn't take any money here. You know, I, I'm not getting paid. I'm like, brother, you probably weren't getting paid anyways. Like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, so-and-so keeps t- saying I'm such a good wrestler, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, what do you want to do? And he's like, let's run your style match. I was like, okay, let's do it. And we run it and he proceeds to forget every spot. Sounds about every, right. Everything. And I'm like chilling in the corner. He like walks to me like with a deer in headlights and I just walk straight from like boom smack him across the fucking face it's like what the fuck <laughs> like it was not good like like i've probably had matches that could have been worse but like that like i think since he talks so much shit yeah i always put that as ranked match like i legit already wrestled somebody like they forgot the first two opening spots so you can see they were lost so i rolled them up within two minutes i was like go home <sighs> because God. i could sense that it was not gonna end well yeah that's the worst feeling and, and like um when i started I had a very hard time remembering stuff and the idea of like remembering stuff that I called my match, but then like also remember someone else was like insane, but it came down to reps and like really uh, for me, creating logic out of the illogical, right? It's like, you have to think about like, not only what you're doing next, but why you're doing it logically in professional wrestling. I think that helped me remember stuff. So now it's like for a guy that has brain damage, I'm pretty good at remembering a, eight, 10, 12, 15, 20 minute match. So when yeah. another guy forgets shit, I try not to go Shawn Michaels 96, but sometimes it happens, Tony, and it's not good. I, I don't go nuts on him, but I'm going to give him one. I got gotcha. you. I'm not going to hit him in the cross. I'm not going to hit him on save because that just makes matters worse. For sure. I agree 100%. I was in a couple, I was a match a couple weeks ago and the, uh, like he forgot uh, two spots and like I was running at him. And he did like he was supposed to bandera me and he didn't like and I was just gonna look really stupid if I stopped. So mm-hmm. I just ran at him, just gave him one of the, you know, one of them. And like he like looked at me and like came out at me. And I grabbed him by the throat and I go, Don't you no sell me again? And I put <laughs> I put him back in the corner, gave him a common gear, he's super safe. And I rolled him around, like, just take the double stomp. And I was like, yeah, I'm like, like you should I'm like, and I got it back. Well, why'd you come out at me like that? I was like, I was safe with that. I'm like, it just made some noise. He goes, I, I just blanked. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You had, to save, like, you had to save it. Yeah. I was, yeah, that's why. Like, I didn't want to run in and just be like, oh. Yeah. Real you, you have to save it some way. Like, For sure. Uh, you know, bringing up wrestling psychology, when you first started, what was the toughest aspect of pro wrestling psychology that you struggled to grasp? Um, I honestly think just trying to make sense of everything. Like, it's easy to make sense when you're in a little sequence here, but to have the whole thing make sense is the hard problem. Like, you could be, like, eight minutes in your match or whatever, and you're like, oh, well, right here is making sense. But then if you went back at the two-minute mark, you're like, when that pulls itself together, like, oh, that part of eight minutes no longer makes sense. Right. And you're like, shit. I get that. Hidden talent. Do you have one? No. I I, am... I come on literally I I play instruments but I'm not that I'm I'm mediocre at them I have legit no I have a really good memory that's all like I could tell you useless facts like if something came up and I'm like oh well you know this or something like that I just read books and 
I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty good with useless facts too because I'll go down like Wikipedia rabbit holes and I like watching documentaries and I'll watch like little YouTube videos about bullshit. But like you know, I think you're you're downplaying your your musical talents because you were in a punk band for a, a, a period of time before professional wrestling. You were a guitarist, right? First, I, well, I do play guitar, but I was a bassist in the band. Like I okay. played for a few years with a couple of my friends, did some stuff. We had some fun, but like I started wrestling more, and I, that's when I just kind of like and and everybody else started fizzling out to other bands, so. Gotcha. Best opponent or most favorite opponent? Andy Harner. No question. You said that instantly. Yeah. Like I have great chemistry with him. I like, I could easily like, and I'll do the craziest shit that I could never do with anybody else. And when I'm with him. Yeah, no, that makes sense. There's just some people that, especially when you have a friendship that you just, you have chemistry with. Oh yeah. I was at Andy's wedding. He was at my wedding. So like, yeah. Easy connection. What's your best fan interaction ever? In which way? Uh, it could be good or bad. <laughs> uh, well, there's like, I like when people give me free weed. That's always cool. Okay. But uh, I I do have a guy that has emailed me a few times asking if I'd sit on his face for $1,000. Okay. I, I get a lot of those too, man. Might be the same guy. <laughs> guy, said, guy said he'd fly me. Well, like I'll say his name after we go off air because I don't want to do that. Cause, like, sure, I'm, not, sure. I'm not trying to shame the guy. Gotcha. But like, he's like, I'll fly you to my area too. And I'm just like, man, a thousand dollars to sit on somebody's face. <laughs> Damn. Maybe it's equal I wish me. I had a thousand extra dollars just to blow on. Like if I was like, Hey, I want somebody to sit on my face. Yeah. What's I, I we, we experience it uh, like this much compared to the girls. And oh, like, yeah. some, some, some of the stuff that these girls get offered, like financially and stuff for like the ridiculous stuff, like give me a pair of socks, make sure you do oh, cardio no, I've in them. Under- I've sold my underwear to guys. I've definitely sold my my trunks and uh, I've definitely made sure to tell them that they were still sweated up. So that way- Oh no, I know. legit sold my underwear. That's- Some dude, one of he's like, I'll give you $80 for sweaty <laughs> underwear. Like, so I went to the gym, I fucking ran like two miles brought a ziplock back with me as soon as i got done i went to the bathroom free balled it out of the gym sent him out love it that is awesome <laughs> dedicated, de- dedicated to the craft hey man you gotta do what you gotta do 80 bucks is 80 bucks right and you didn't have to do anything yeah. for it you just sweat in your underwear i pay like 10 bucks for a pack of underwear so i made 70 dollars profit I, I've, I've told the full story on the podcast before so i won't tell it again but literally there's a guy who at least once a year emails me or sends me a facebook message and he also has cerebral palsy, mild like mine, but he's like seven years old. He's an athletic swimmer. And the first email he ever sent me, and then it like continued after that, was he basically said, uh, try, try not to make it seem weird. And he said, uh, I like to wrestle, would like to wrestle you. Are you in, ever in Pennsylvania? Uh, but when I wrestle, I don't get a ring. I like to get a, a, a hotel and I push the bed to the side so that we could just wrestle on the floor. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking to myself, oh, he thinks he's gonna trick me into like <laughs> falling in love with him or something. Cause you know, he mentioned how he does a crushing body scissors and that's like his special move. And I just think to myself he, in his brain, in his sick mind, he thinks he's gonna move these beds to the side and he's gonna put me in a crushing body scissors. And I'm gonna go, you know what? I think I like this more than just in a wrestling aspect. And then that, that would be it. That's crazy, right? Like this slave for life. Just so absurd, but pro wrestling, it, it's brought us so much absurdity, but it's also brought us stuff that we could have only dreamed about. Cause like, I don't know about you, Tony, but like the things that I've done as a pro wrestler, uh, I, I, I would tell people I was going to do them, but then when I did them, it was like, Oh, holy shit, that really happened. I mean, it, it's gotta be the most surreal experience. I've, uh, flown this entire country on somebody else's dime. I've been to 26 different States and I have never paid for a single flight. That's you amazing. know, like, I, and I'm from a small town of Pennsylvania, so I'm like very grateful for the options I've been given. Uh, like, everybody that talks to me, like, oh wow, like, that's really like, it must be really nice. I was like, I'm just grateful. Like, I I remember driving hours in cars. I remember getting twenty dollars and never making any money and sacrificing everything. So like this is really cool to me. Like my local newspaper back home in Shemokin and put a front page cover about me when I was doing really well. Like when I just started, like when I quit my job, I started working uh, like PWG and all that stuff. Like they made an entire front page of me and they also have a little section where they update people about wrestling every week. And they talk about me every week telling everyone what I'm up to. 
That's awesome. And I've had people message me that I went to high school with that I never talked to. And they're like, dude, it's amazing to see you're doing this. So, yeah. And I'm glad you're doing it. I'm glad that I've created a friendship with you over the last few years. And uh, you just, you, you do incredible stuff. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me for a little bit today. And before we go, I want to ask you what I ask everybody, because, you know, some people say that I'm an inspiration, but I look at myself as just Craig. So I like to ask everybody, Tony, what inspires you to keep going in life, in pro wrestling? What's your inspiration? My family, to be honest, at everything. Like I, I do everything for them, uh, despite not being home sometimes. I was, I was hoping my situation, because my son's going to be a year old and two, three days. I was hoping my situation was a little bit better with Ring of Honor because I, I, you know, I, I saw myself being signed by this time next year and that's not the case. And now those places that are willing to sign me to guaranteed money are becoming more scarce. And now it's just like, what do I do? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I care more about my family at this point than maybe wrestling. So like, I, I got to really evaluate, you know, my life currently, like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm hoping things kick off a little bit more and, you know, some people take notice, but right now I'm just taking it for day to day. Cause like at the end of the day, who I fight for is my wife, my son, and I'm going to have a daughter in February. Oh, wow. Congratulations. So, thank you. Like, so like, these are the people that keeps me going. <laughs> yeah. Know? And, but like, but I love wrestling so much. Like, so it'd be so hard to give up. Like if I ever legitimately had to retire, you would see me in a ring crying uncontrollably. Cause I love wrestling. This is all I've known. This is all I've ever been good at. And I, I, I wouldn't know what to do. I don't like, I, I literally do not know what to do the second I have to leave wrestling. I get that. I get I'm going to mow my lawn or something. Is that what people do? Like what do, what do <laughs> normal people do? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's scary to think about sometimes, but you know what? We have these ups and downs within our pro wrestling careers, but I, I got a feeling the best has yet to come for Tony Depp and I got faith for you, buddy. That's, that's what, uh, Delirious told me. I mean, Cause like he apologized for everything. He's like, I just feel like there's a uh, uh, skim the surface of what you can do. And I hope, everybody that says that is correct. It's just the hardest thing is just like, you know, like, like, cause and Dick, like, and this is, an, I'm not the only person like Dickinson is another example. Like we go, him and I go through waves and valleys when it comes to our career. It looks like we're getting to the peak of our valley. And then all of a sudden the like, caves out anything, we drop right back down to the square one. Like, and, and like at some days you're like, man, like, it'd be nice to have that. Like where like you see some of these kids that are so young, they do one thing and there's like, boom, yeah. sign like, damn, I like, and that's not disparaging them at any way, shape, or form, because all of them are great people. Like it would, like I'm just like, damn, that'd be nice. I, like I would, I would love, I, I would trade, like, because a lot of them always like, oh, I wish I could work PWG. I wish I could go to Japan. I wish it was like motherfucker. I would trade all of that for your position right now. Yeah, to me. but you know what? I feel like those down moments for guys like us that stay humble and keep grinding and keep working hard. When we have those ups, I think it makes it. Uh, we appreciate it that much more. And uh, I think at the end of the day, your love and your passion for professional wrestling will shine through someone that matters is going to notice. I know that I notice. I don't know that that means anything, but like, I've got faith in you, buddy. I know that, you know, in the next year, things are going to be better. I mean, you got another kid coming. It's going to be great, Tony. It has to be better. It'll be great. It has to be. There, there is no choice, but uh, thank you again for talking with me for Geez, about an hour. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I kept you for so long, but I appreciate your time. I ain't doing and, shit. My son was just crawling around, so it didn't bother me. Hell yeah! What uh, if someone wanted to find Tony Deppen on social media? How could they do so? Uh, Twitter, uh, Tony underscore Deppen. Uh, then I have Instagram, which is Insta Deppen. And don't add me on Facebook because I'm not going to add you. <laughs> it's a, it, that's a personal thing. That's a personal bitch. I have like over a thousand people sitting in my inbox. And I, and I don't, I haven't reached the capacity at all. I'm not even close to it. Sure. I just like, I don't know you. I get it. If I know you, yes. But if I don't, no, thank you. Don't add them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Tony. Thank you again for your time. And thanks for having me, Greg. That was the 
interview with Tony Deppin. We thanks, we thanks, we thank Tony <laughs> for taking the time to talk with me for a little bit. And yeah, what a story! What a guy! He's not the character that he portrays in the ring. Clearly, uh, he's definitely a very angry, dastardly heel on screen, but behind the scenes, he's just a mild mannered guy. Hey man. I liked everything about the interview. Yeah. Good deal. I hope you listened intently. <laughs> I did. Because I'm going to ask you three things Okay. that you learned about Tony Deppin. All right. Give me one. What's one thing that you know about Tony Deppin? He comes out to We Built This City by Jefferson Starship. That's correct. You know what? I liked them when they were Starship, and they were just Starship, And they had a song called It's Not Over Till It's Over. Do you know Mm -hmm. that song? Uh, I don't believe I do. Very inspirational. And uh, sometimes if if you get the right version of the video, there's baseball highlights during it. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was 80s. Probably 88, my guess. As a baseball guy, I'll have to look into that. I'm glad you will. Uh, Give me uh, something else that you know about Tony Deppin. Well... He had a feud with Ron Funches, the very famous comedian. That is true. They did have a battle at GCW in uh, California. Right. Uh, I feel like those were two gimmies, though. Pretty easy, simplistic things that a lot of people would probably already know about Tony. Give me one thing, one obscure fact that you learned about Tony Deppin today during the interview. Third thing. What is it? Okay. His real name is Antonio. He never said that. He said it. No, he didn't. Yeah, he said it. He said, my real name is Antonio. Antonio Deppin? (laughs) Yeah. That's not something he said? He didn't say that. I'm pretty sure he said it. San Antonio. San Antonio Deppin. No. No, I'm his real name is Anthony. Okay. But when he's in S- Spain, they call him Antonio. <clears throat> That's the worst third thing you've ever said. And also I don't know if he's ever been to Spain. He didn't mention it. Yeah, he said it in there. I heard it, it was like uh I would say minute. 12. Okay. You're lying and you're an actual moron. I'm sorry. No, you're not. That's the end of the show. Come back next week when we'll have another great guest, I would imagine, and another great show. And we thank you for joining us. And until next week, make sure you follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Iron On Wrestling. Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Subscribe to us on YouTube where we have some rare wrestling videos on there. And, of course, we put the podcast on there as well. Make sure you follow me on social media at Gregory Iron on Twitter, at Gregory underscore Iron on Instagram, and find me on Facebook as well. It's facebook.com slash The Handicapped Hero. If you want to book me for pro wrestling, speaking engagements, or wrestling seminars, Go to my website, gregory-iron.com, or slide into my DMs. Uh, You're more than likely to get to me that way anyways, as far as bookings go of any kind. Go to my store, prowrestlingtees.com slash gregoryiron. If you want to buy t-shirts, you can also buy Aaron shirts there. You can buy other Iron on Wrestling podcast shirts right there at Pro Wrestling Tees. Aaron, what would you like to plug? At Fair to Air on Twitter. At Fair to Aaron on Instagram. I think that's all I got. Sounds good. Come back again next week. Until then, here's a luscious, thick, moist kiss goodbye.